The BBC is interrupting its normal programmes to bring you an important announcement. This is BBC News from London. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. In a statement, the palace said the Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. BBC Television is broadcasting this special programme reporting the death of Her Majesty the Queen. This is BBC News from London. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. In a statement, the palace said the Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. The death of Her Majesty brings to an end the longest reign in British history spanning eight decades of immense change. Throughout that time, Her Majesty was the one constant presence in public life, a head of state who personified stability and reassurance. Her life had been dedicated to the service of the people and her reign was characterised by a steadfast sense of duty. Elizabeth was just 25 when she came to the throne in 1952, on the sudden death of her father, King George VI, as Britain was still recovering from the Second World War. She was sustained by her 73-year marriage to the late Prince Philip. Her strength and stay, as she once described him, was at her side for three major jubilee celebrations. Elizabeth II was the most widely travelled head of state in history. The Queen of 15 nations, head of the Commonwealth of 54 countries and territories. Her Majesty's death brings the second Elizabethan age to a close and a long and momentous chapter in British life, a reign marked above all else by a sense of service to others, a reign unlike any other in the long history of Britain and the Commonwealth. Our Royal Correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, is with me as we report the news of the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And one thinks immediately, Nick, first of all, of the loss for the royal family. One does. This, for the nation, for them, this is an absolutely massive moment. The moment that so many people have dreaded for so long has come. It's a moment of great solemnity and national sadness. It's hard, really, fully to take it in. It's no great surprise, given her age and her declining health. But nonetheless, it is a very considerable shock to feel that she has died. Now, millions of people, I think, as they learn this news, will feel a sense of personal loss. And I think many people will find it rather disorientating. Let's just understand this moment. It isn't just the death of the longest lived, 
longest reigning monarch in British history, a monarch who has been there in the background to our lives, for most of us, for all of our lives. It is the end of what I think history will judge to have been one of the most remarkable reigns in the thousand plus year, years of the British monarchy, a reign which will be remembered and talked about in years to come. Now, whether you are a monarchist or not, and we know, as we've said this afternoon, that not everyone is, she was a monarch who earned the widest possible respect here in the United Kingdom and throughout the world. It's the end of the reign of Elizabeth II, a monarch who always put duty first, who brought dignity and decency to the highest office in the land, who embodied the best of qualities, who's been a focus for national unity and identity, and who has been the still calm centre of stability and reassurance to this nation and the other nations of which she has been head of state for more than 70 years, while so much around her has changed. She has been a distillation of our national identity. She has been constant in an ever-shifting world, constant, steadfast, dependable, dutiful. These are all rather old-fashioned words, old-fashioned concepts even, but I think that they sum up what she brought to the role of monarch. We recall the pledge she made on her 21st birthday, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. Well, she truly remained true to that pledge. It was a life of finely judged service, true to the principles of constitutional monarchy, driven by duty, sustained by faith. And we recall also the message that uh, she issued when she reached her 70th birthday in February of this year. You remember the message that was issued? She wrote, I remain eternally grateful for and humbled by the loyalty and affection that you continue to give me. She said, I look forward to continuing to serve you with all of my heart. And she signed that message, your servant, Elizabeth R. Well, that servant has gone. The end of the reign of Elizabeth II. Elizabeth the Great, as many people will regard her, that reign has ended. And we have a new king. Yes. The crown passes invisibly, but immediately, imperceptibly. Charles is now our king and our head of state. Camilla is now queen consort. It remains to be seen what name he will take, but uh, we will refer to him as the king, and he will lead the nation's mourning for his mother. As you say, she came to the throne just a few years after the end of the Second World War. She succeeded to the throne in 1952 after the death of her father. And on the night of her coronation, in a broadcast on the BBC, she said, throughout all of my life and with all of my heart, I shall strive to be worthy of your service. And as that message, and as the message she issued on the 70th anniversary of her accession showed, if there is one word that I think is the key to the success of her reign, I would suggest it's, it's not actually duty, the word which is normally associated with her, it's humility. Because for all of the grandness of her position here is the coronation, the imperial state crown being lowered onto her head by the Archbishop of Canterbury. For all the grandness of, of, of her position, it never went to her head. She had, I think, an instinctive understanding that as a hereditary monarch, she had to win the trust of the people of this country and the other countries of which she was queen. And that, I believe, is what she did. She gained it and she kept it. She kept the monarchy strong. Now, of course, there have been a few bumps along the way. It would be extraordinary if there hadn't been. Bumps which have almost without exception been caused by other members of her family. But she pursued her role with that sense of humility and by putting duty first. And she was at heart, people who knew her, it's funny to talk in the past tense now, yes. isn't it? 
She was a very down-to-earth, a straightforward and unpretentious woman, rather reserved, certainly in her early years. There was none of that sort of vainglorious and overbearing behaviour that we've sometimes perhaps seen with other members of her family. For 70 years, she's been the constant, unchanging presence in the background to our lives, the head of the nation, as she's sometimes been referred to, above politics, but with a shrewd interest in and a grasp of politics and of political figures. So we now look back on, and there will be so many tributes, mm. so many tributes now, as people take this in, as they come to terms with their own emotions. And I'm quite sure there will be many people who are very emotional yeah. at this moment, yeah. as they learn of this news, the death of the Queen. But uh, this nation and so many other nations will now pay tribute to this long life of service, which has now ended. Symbolized everywhere, Nick. The flags are being lowered and the rainbow, along with the lowered flag at Windsor, the, uh, the favorite home of the Queen, so many years. Flags lowered already at Buckingham Palace. And so many elements, Nick, of your appreciation and tribute will be echoed by political leaders at Downing Street. We're expecting Liz Truss to say something fairly soon. Uh, the Prime Minister will offer her own sympathy to the royal family and she will, of course, have her own words of appreciation for the long service of Her Majesty. And uh, there'll be other political leaders too wanting to pay tribute to a lifetime of service, a lifetime of humble commitment to duty, as Nick was saying, and of taking the role as seriously as it's possible to take it, uh, very much in line with the teaching that her father had shared with her all those years ago in Buckingham Palace, King George VI, very proud of his two daughters and took a long time to offer the experience and learning to his elder daughter, Elizabeth. And there you have at the railings of Buckingham Palace, they are in line with tradition, posting the formal notice. And that notice will say that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has died peacefully today at Balmoral in Scotland the age of 96, the longest reigning monarch in British history. A lifetime of service to people in the United Kingdom, throughout the Commonwealth and in many parts of the world. An example of leadership which didn't stray into the realm of politics and for lots of people the ideal symbol of what a constitutional monarchy should be like. Well, now the world has been told and the official notice has been posted as the palace staff make their way back into what was the Queen's home. It is now the home of the King and the Queen Consort because Prince Charles is now King Charles. It remains to be seen whether he will call himself Charles as King, but we are assuming that he will. And this now is the home of the new monarch, the King, and his consort, the Queen Consort. Crowd still gathering at Buckingham Palace because the news has travelled very rapidly here and at Windsor and at all the other royal residences. But of course, people will be following these events closely on their televisions and their mobile devices and all kinds of different means of spreading the news and social media as people come to terms with what's happened. And as Nick was saying memorably a few moments ago, it's a seismic event 
It's the longest reigning monarch in British history who has left us at the age of 96. And it's not a surprise when someone of that age suffers ill health and eventually passes away. But what is left, of course, is the reflection on what was achieved and the kind of life that was led and the sense of duty and the sense of loyalty and, as Nick was saying, the sense of humility, which seems rather bizarre to say for a monarch, but someone who had a sense of service to others. And uh, this was a theme that was repeated so often in the Queen's statements at great milestones in her life, in those four great jubilees, where she underlined the notion of service, to be at the service of the people, and to appreciate the fact that people were loyal to her as a monarch and appreciated the fact that she was of, well, incalculable value in terms of her service to Britain, having come to the throne at such a young age and with very little experience. At the age of 25, when she didn't expect to be in that position at all, her father suddenly uh, dying in his 50s, a terrible blow and then a huge burden for the young queen to be bearing. But she did so, and with a strong sense of what the monarchy was meant to be, uh, the sense that her father had shared with her. And as we said earlier, for those considering the nature of the reign, the longest reign in British history, it was in many senses a continuation of the reign of George the Sixth. The crowds at the palace will have seen this formal announcement. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and Queen Consort will be staying at Balmoral tonight and will be returning to London tomorrow. And that is the formal announcement to the world in the traditional way, the uh, printed statement being fixed to the railings of Buckingham Palace. And that, when we see that, Nick, that is the chapter completed. And the vehicles there outside Buckingham Palace are stopping. The word will be reaching people. People will be very shocked, I think, by this. I think it is very hard to take it in. But there is, as you say, the news. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon, so presumably she must have died before the uh, members of her family arrived at Balmoral, but uh, they will have known, as they drove in through the gates, they will have known that the Queen, their mother, or their grandmother, had died. Uh, it doesn't make any reference as to whether the King was uh, at her bedside, but we do know that Charles and Camilla had uh, travelled across to Balmoral Castle, so one presumes that they will have been there at the end and the Princess Royal as well, uh, one must assume, though they have not said that. And of course there will be many arrangements, but before the arrangements there will be all the tributes. And those will be on a scale that we have really not mm -hmm. seen before. No. They've started, Nick, already, as you can imagine. Uh, President Biden, the White House, uh, he and his wife saying our hearts and thoughts go to the Queen's family. And the British people, of course, um, coming from our strongest ally. So you'd expect the statement to be warm and sincere as it is. But as you say, Nick, it'll be um, just the start of countless tributes from world leaders, religious leaders. And of course, I think it's right to say this, from millions of people, from yes. ordinary people, yes. will want to be sharing their sense of loss. Yes, yes. And that sense of loss will be deep and it will be widespread. As we've both been saying, people will feel a personal loss, that a, a person who they in some way knew or felt they knew has gone, who was always there, who was this reassuring presence, this embodiment of stability and continuity and who personified the unity of the United Kingdom. It is, as I think you used the word, it is a seismic 
event in terms of uh, the United Kingdom. And of course, it, I think, will rather add to that sense of flux that we have at the moment. Yes. Uh, of political change with a new prime minister, mm. of uh, economic crisis with all the energy costs, gosh, who's mm. giving a thought to that huge statement that the new prime minister made in the House of Commons today about yeah. that. There is war in Europe. Well, the monarchy in one of those um, hard to put your finger on ways is a stabilizing and unifying force and that will be the challenge now for Charles as king and he I'm sure will want to act quickly. He will lead the mourning for mm -hmm. his mother, for the queen, but he will I'm sure also want to just indicate that he understands what is required mm. as a constitutional monarch. He has already indicated that he does completely understand that it is a different role, that he will have to give up his interventions. Uh, but I think that he will reign in a slightly different way. I mean, the fundamentals are the same, but each monarch brings something of their own personality to the role. And I think that Charles will try to uh, continue his interest in some of those issues without in any way allowing politics or a political uh, scope to come into it. I'm told, Nick, that we are expecting a statement from the new king fairly shortly. Um, so when we have that, we'll bring it right away. And as we look at these rather nice images of Her Majesty, um, of course, engaged in one of the endless official engagements that she's uh, that she's done over the years. Um, it's worth bringing in as well uh, some remarks from the Dutch royal family because uh, the British royal family and the Dutch royal family have uh, enjoyed close relations over the years. The Dutch royal family saying, we remember Queen Elizabeth II with deep respect and with great affection. Uh, steadfast and wise, uh, she dedicated her long life to serving the British people. We feel a strong bond uh, this is the King of um, the uh, Netherlands. We feel a strong bond with the United Kingdom and his royal family, and we share their sorrow at this time. And we're very grateful for our country's close friendship, uh, to which Queen Elizabeth made such an unforgettable contribution. Uh, King Willem Alexander and Queen Maxima and Princess Beatrix of the Netherlands offering their tributes. Uh, just worth underlining the scale and the importance and the impact of what we are reporting today. It is a huge milestone in the history of the United Kingdom. The fact that the Queen, who was crowned back in 1953, has died peacefully at Balmoral in Scotland this afternoon the King, that is uh, King Charles, and the uh, Queen Consort um, will be staying at Balmoral this evening and then uh, we will be expecting them to return to London tomorrow. And uh, that's a statement also expected from the new King uh, sometime in the next uh, maybe 20 minutes or so. But these images remind us of those happy days which really do just set the foundations really for a hugely successful and productive reign. Coronation Day back in 1953, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, uh, just on the right hand side there, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, just behind her. But the Queen, the young Queen, um, became Queen at the age of 25, acknowledging the huge crowd that had gathered on Coronation Day back in 1953, where we're looking at the woman who would become the longest reigning monarch in the history of the United Kingdom. And here we are in 2022, reporting on the Queen's death. At the age of 96, uh, Buckingham Palace formally making that announcement a short while ago, uh, saying that the Queen, whose health was uh, the matter of a, a bulletin earlier today, with doctors expressing their concern, the Queen died peacefully at Balmoral during the course of this evening. We don't have a precise time, 
but we do know that uh, several members of the royal family um, were at Balmoral and uh, they were no doubt in a meeting with the doctors and the experts when they got there and indeed the news came fairly soon after their arrival that Her Majesty had indeed passed away at the age of 96. Earlier today uh, they were saying that she was being kept comfortable in Balmoral. There was no sign of any move to hospital, no sign of any further intervention by doctors in a different kind of facility. Uh, all the care was being done at Balmoral itself uh, and indeed a few hours later came the very sad news uh, which will affect many millions of people that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has died at the age of 96, having lost her husband, uh, Prince Philip, back in 2021. And on the Queen's death, we now have a new king. Uh, Prince Charles will become King Charles, possibly, uh, with a consort who will be the Queen consort. Um, known as Camilla, uh, the Duchess of Cornwall. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest serving monarch in the history of the United Kingdom and the commanding presence in British public life for more than eight decades. Uh, she died at Balmoral in Aberdeenshire, today at the age of 96. The Queen's eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has become king. And within the past few minutes, Buckingham Palace released this formal statement. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. We are expecting a statement from the new king fairly shortly. We're also expecting a statement from the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who uh, visited the Queen in Balmoral just a couple of days ago um, and uh, was able to accept the invitation to form a government in that audience uh, where the Queen was seen to be smiling broadly and looked very focused on the task at hand, uh, albeit looking rather frail. Um, well, that was two days ago, and uh, yesterday came the news that she was unable to fulfil an appointment with the Privy Council, that's the senior ministers in the new government of Liz Truss. Um, it was to be an online meeting, but nonetheless, the Queen was judged to be too tired, and uh, she needed to rest. She wasn't well, and her doctor suggested last evening that uh, that meeting should not be held and she was resting last night. And by this morning, indeed, uh, late morning, uh, the Queen's doctors were clearly very concerned and that the Queen's condition had deteriorated fairly rapidly. And then by lunchtime, we had the statement that her health was causing particular concern. And then we saw the members of the family arriving at Balmoral. And shortly after that, within the past uh, half hour or so, came the formal statement uh, that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has died at the age of 96. We have statements from lots of world leaders. We'll come to them in a second. Uh, the President of the Irish Republic, for example, uh, Michael D. Higgins. Uh, the Queen visited the Irish Republic back in 2011. She was the first British monarch to visit the Irish Republic. It was a hugely successful uh, meeting. I've got a very warm welcome there. Her Majesty, says President uh, Higgins, served the British people with exceptional dignity. Her personal commitment to her role and extraordinary sense of duty were the hallmarks of her period as Queen, which will hold a unique place in British history. There aren't many who will disagree with that. That's uh, President Michael Higgins of the Republic of Ireland. The Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Justin Welby, uh, has just issued this statement, uh, which of course will be welcomed by Charles as the new king as well. He says, may Her late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II rest in peace and rise 
in glory. Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, as she had done before, uh, she reminded us of a deep truth about ourselves, says the Archbishop. We are a people of hope who care for one another. A very warm tribute and a sincere tribute from the Archbishop himself. Um, I think we can bring a little more from the Archbishop and it's a very eloquent tribute as you'd imagine from Justin Welby. It's with profound sadness, says the Archbishop, that I join the nation, the Commonwealth and the world in mourning the death of Her Late Majesty the Queen. My prayers are with the King and with the Royal Family. May God draw near them and comfort them in the days and weeks and months ahead. The Archbishop goes on as we grieve together. We know that in losing our beloved Queen, we have lost the person whose steadfast loyalty, service and humility has helped us make sense of who we are through decades of extraordinary change in our world, our nation and society. And as deep as our grief runs, even deeper is our gratitude for Her Late Majesty's extraordinary dedication to the United Kingdom, her realms and the Commonwealth. Through times of war and hardship, says the Archbishop, through seasons of upheaval and change, and through moments of joy and celebration, we have sustained by Her Late Majesty's faith in what and who we are called to be. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, with that moving statement. We also have a statement from the King, from Charles, who became King on the death of his mother. And Charles says this, We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. The tribute there by the new king, uh, by Charles, who became king immediately on his mother's death. So the tone, as one would expect, is loving, it's warm, it's respectful, and it just underlines the affection in which the Queen was held. We are expecting the Prime Minister in just a moment, Nick, but that statement was moving, wasn't it? It was, yes. My beloved mother, uh, a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all the members of my family. Interesting that it's not signed as King Charles. There's no name on it. Um, it has been suggested that he might take another name as King, but I suspect it'll be tomorrow before we uh, learn that. But yes, um, it's quite hard to sum up the profound nature of this moment, isn't it, really? Um, they have lost their mother or their grandmother. They must grieve privately, but Charles must now begin to assert himself and begin his reign. I'm sure he will travel around the country. Um, he will... I mean, this is challenging. It would be challenging for anybody. And we're about clearly to hear now from the Prime Minister. We are all devastated by the news that we have just heard from Balmoral. The death of Her Majesty the Queen is a huge shock to the nation and to the world. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. She ascended the throne just after the Second World War. She championed the development of the Commonwealth from a small group of seven countries to a family of 56 nations spanning every continent of the world. We are now a modern, thriving, dynamic nation. Through thick and thin, Queen Elizabeth II provided us with the stability and the strength that we needed. 
She was the very spirit of Great Britain, and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. Her, her life of service stretched beyond most of our living memories. In return, she was loved and admired by the people in the United Kingdom and all around the world. She has been a personal inspiration to me and to many Britons. Her devotion to duty is an example to us all. Earlier this week, at 96, she remained determined to carry out her duties as she appointed me as her 15th Prime Minister. Throughout her life, she's visited more than 100 countries and she has touched the lives of millions around the world. In the difficult days ahead, we will come together with our friends across the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and the world to celebrate her extraordinary lifetime of service. It is a day of great loss, but Queen Elizabeth II leaves a great legacy. Today, the crown passes, as it has done for more than a thousand years, to our new monarch, our new head of state, His Majesty, King Charles III. With the King's family, we mourn the loss of his mother, and as we mourn, we must come together as a people to support him, to help him bear the awesome responsibility that he now carries for us all. We offer him our loyalty and devotion, just as his mother devoted so much to so many for so long. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. The Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who was installed at Downing Street just a couple of days ago, having met the Queen in that audience, uh, really presenting her own tribute with some personal elements in that, but also revealing something which we were hoping to hear either from the Prime Minister or from the Palace, which is that Charles will be known as King Charles III, Nick, and uh, that is at least confirming the title that he has adopted. Yep, that answers that question. And of course, for him, for Charles, there will be conflicting emotions at this moment. Yeah. There is the great sadness that he refers to in his statement of the loss of his mother. Uh, but at the same time, this is the moment when he finally achieves his destiny. He is the oldest and longest serving heir apparent in British history. He will be the, the oldest person to become king in British history. The, previously, the oldest person was William IV, who became king in uh, 1830, aged 64. Well, Charles is 73. Uh, so, and he will know that this is a challenge for anybody to step into the position so successfully occupied for so many years by Elizabeth II. And he has had a long time to think about this. He's never spoken about it publicly because that uh, really would not be appropriate. Uh, the only clue he has given is that he fully understands that the role of monarch is different to that of Prince of Wales. So he has uh, assured people that he will not meddle, which is the one great concern that people have had about him. It was the one area in which, uh, one area among many, that uh, the Queen, Elizabeth, was so successful. She understood the limits, what a monarch needed to do, how far a monarch could go. Um, and Charles, one can be confident, also must understand that. So he will um, uh, reign in a in, in his own way, but within the constraints of the constitutional monarchy. So he understands that, though he may, I think, attempt to be a little bit more proactive than the Queen has been throughout, or the Queen was yes. throughout her yes. reign. He, I think, will attempt to use the convening powers. But that, again, that is really all for the future. Um, he will, I think, travel around the country. He will want to establish himself want to lead the nation's mourning for his mother, 
now that the reign, the long reign of Elizabeth II has ended. I just want to share again the statement made by the new king. Uh, this is the statement by King Charles III. And he says, the, the death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. And Charles goes on, we mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country and the realms and the Commonwealth and by countless people around the world. And during this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. A statement by uh, the former Prince of Wales, now King Charles III, because the Prime Minister has confirmed that the uh, Queen, now having died at the age of 96, has been succeeded by Charles and will be known as King Charles III and uh, the Queen Consort, of course, Camilla. Let's go to Downing Street then, where the Prime Minister Liz Truss has just delivered her tribute and joined Chris Mason, our political editor. Um, the Prime Minister certainly wanted to pay tribute to the Queen's long, long record of service, uh, Chris, but also wanted to, I suppose, introduce a little bit of a personal element in the sense that she said that the Queen for her had been uh, very much someone who'd inspired her over the years. Yes, that's right, Hugh. And a Prime Minister just 48 hours in office tasked with finding the words for such a profound moment in our country's history. Just picking out a few of the sentences that struck me in the statement from Liz Trust just a, a few moments ago. The rock on which modern Britain was built, she reflected uh, about Her Majesty the Queen. Britain is a great country today uh, because of her and because of her stability and strength that she encapsulated and personified, the Prime Minister said, the spirit of Great Britain. As you just mentioned in conversation uh, with Nick, uh, the news from the Prime Minister uh, that the King will be known as His Majesty King Charles III. And then uh, the profound solemnity and gravity of those final words uh, from Liz Truss. God save the King. When we look at the... Um the change that's now happening, Chris, because clearly there are big implications um, for Downing Street and government, given the very strong axis that exists between the, uh, the office of the monarch and uh, the executive and parliament in this constitutional monarchy that we have. Um, what, what will be happening, do you think, now in terms of the administration in Downing Street? What are the things that they will need to come to terms with, given that we now have a new monarch? It'll be a profound change, a significant change at a time politically of considerable flux. It is, of course, a new team that have moved into Downing Street, not just the Prime Minister, but so many of her senior advisers in the last 48 hours or so, themselves trying to work out how the very heart of British government and the British state on the political side operates. Now within that and beyond that in the broader governmental machine are procedures and protocols as term, in terms of the conversations that take place between Downing Street as an institution and Buckingham Palace, the monarchy as an institution. But nonetheless, obviously it's such a profound historical moment, things will change. A Prime Minister who had just had a single audience with the Queen, that first audience also being her last one and in future of course those audiences they are gatherings that take place once a week where the Prime Minister heads to see the monarch and has a period of time privately in their company knowing in, in the political world it being the one opportunity where you can talk very candidly to someone without the prospect 
of it being leaked, that that in the future for the Prime Minister will be very different from the one that she might have anticipated, from the one that so many of her predecessors, 14 of her predecessors, have enjoyed that conversation that they had uh, with the Queen, more recently uh, taking place remotely, traditionally taking place physically at Buckingham Palace, where Prime Minister after Prime Minister, 15 in total, including uh, Liz Truss, were able to spend that time with the Queen and tap into a well of knowledge and savvy and wisdom about world affairs that was unprecedented. A stateswoman of a longevity greater than any other on earth. And with that, Prime Ministers would so often reflect in interviews and in their memoirs just how valuable a relationship that was. Firstly, as I say, because it was grounded in that sense of solemnity and privacy, but secondly, because of the, the wisdom and experience uh, that the Queen was able to bring. Chris, for now, many thanks. Chris Mason, our political editor. Um, and as you can imagine, lots of political leaders are wanting to pay their own tributes um, from Scotland. And of course, let's just underline the fact that the Queen passed away at Balmoral in Aberdeenshire. So the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, um, has been uh, uh, sharing her response to what's happened today and the Queen's death. She said it was a profoundly sad moment for the UK, the Commonwealth and the world. And then the First Minister goes on to say, the Queen's life was one of extraordinary dedication and service. And uh, she said, on behalf of the people of Scotland, I convey my deepest condolences to the King and to the Royal Family. First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, with the statement that she issued just a few moments ago. The time is 20 past seven, and you're watching this extended coverage from BBC News on this very, very sad day because we are reporting the death of Queen Elizabeth the second. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth, the longest serving monarch in the history of the United Kingdom and the commanding presence in British public life uh, over a span of eight decades. She died at Balmoral in Aberdeenshire uh, today at the age of 96. The Queen's eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has become King Charles III. Now, within the past few minutes, Buckingham Palace released the formal statement. It said this, The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. That is the brief statement um, stating uh, the events of the past hour or so and the fact of the Queen's death at the age of 96 after the longest uh, reign in the history uh, of the United Kingdom. And Nicholas Witchell, uh, our Royal Correspondent, is with us. Um, by now, Nick, of course, um, this news will be around the world. And that is why we are seeing, of course, responses from uh, countries as far afield as uh, um, Japan and the United States and, of course, European countries, the European Union, uh, those tributes will come in. Um, but for the people of the UK, we mentioned earlier that, of course, we were thinking about the impact on the royal family. Let's dwell then on the impact on the people of the United Kingdom, for whom the Queen has been this symbol, not just of authority, but a, a symbol of real solidity mm. um, and of consistency. Uh, over the years. Taking that symbol away, albeit with a, a new monarch, King Charles III, who's a very familiar figure, but taking that symbol away will have an effect on people's lives, even those who are not dedicated monarchists. It is a huge loss, and I think many people will find it disorientating, the feeling that uh, this person who has been such a constant presence 
in the background of their lives that this person is no longer there. It is hard, really, to take it in, to speak of her in the past tense, to fully appreciate that this reign, this longest reign in British history, is finally over. I mean, so many people over the years have said, we wish she could reign forever, we wish she could go on forever. Well, clearly, not possible, but um, that reign ended this afternoon. At uh, Balmoral, we now have both a new head of state and a new head of government in the Prime Minister. Uh, who could have imagined that within the space of 48 hours? Um, we will now await details of, of course, a state funeral, which will take place probably in about 10 days' time. Mm -hmm. That'll be the first full state funeral in the, the United Kingdom since that of Winston Churchill back in 1965. Um, and Britain will mourn and many people around the world will mm. mourn also the passing of uh, Elizabeth II. That presence who was there, the constant and reassuring presence whilst so much around her changed. Um, every aspect of life, not just in this nation, but in every other nation around the world has, has altered, but she was the one uh, constant dependable factor in so many of our lives, always there. If you think about uh, the way in which uh, culturally this nation has changed, it was monocultural when she came to the throne, multicultural now. It was very much empire orientated, the United Kingdom in 1952 when she succeeded to the throne. Uh, there is the Commonwealth, uh, the United Kingdom has, as it were, dallied with Europe and has sort of moved away from it. Um, when she came to the throne, a majority of people believed that she was chosen by God. Yeah. Uh, there was still, of course, a much greater sense of deference. We're seeing some images here from the earlier stages of her life. She was, uh, there she is, uh, presenting the World Cup yeah. to Bobby Moore in 1966, and of course meeting so many American presidents there with uh, the first George Bush, and pursuing her great passion of horse racing. Um, in just so many facets of national life, the Queen was there. This uh, dutiful figure, driven by faith, propelled by duty, with this sense of humility that we were talking about earlier. She was down to earth and straightforward. And as I said, she never let it go to her head. She realized that uh, she was there by a, yeah. an accident of birth and that she needed to win the trust and respect of her people. And that perhaps is something that not every member of her family has fully appreciated. Well, she did in the same way that her father did. And in the same way, I think that uh, Charles has also appreciated that because he has worked so hard. Prince Charles, you know, uh, been um, a few controversies and difficulties for him, but he has set out during his uh, time as Prince of Wales to win the respect of people and to show that he is worthy of the office and the position to which he has now succeeded. There he is with his mother. Mm. He is now mourning the loss of that mother and the loss of the Queen as he becomes king. Now we must assume that the Prime Minister Liz Truss has not, as it were, jumped the gun in naming him as King Charles III. It's not been confirmed by Buckingham Palace, but we must assume that that is correct. Just um, as you speak, think your timing is impeccable. Uh, Clarence House has literally, in the last couple of seconds, confirmed that it is King Charles III. So, um, uh, well done on prompting that. Very good. Very good. So it is King Charles III, that's official. Um, and I'm just going to interrupt a second, Nick, if I may, because Boris Johnson, who of course was Prime Minister until just a few days ago, um, has issued this statement. Um, it's fairly lengthy, but I'm going to just read through it because it's, um, it's it, well, you'll understand why. Um, this is our country's saddest day, says Boris Johnson. Uh, in the hearts of every one of us, there is an ache at the passing of our Queen, a deep and personal sense of loss, far more intense perhaps than we expected. Uh, in these first since the news, I know that millions and millions of people have been pausing whatever they've been doing to think about Queen Elizabeth and about the bright and shining light that has finally gone out. These are the words of Boris Johnson. Uh, she seemed so timeless, he says, and so wonderful that I'm afraid we've come to believe, like children, that she would just go on and on. 
And Mr Johnson says, wave after wave of grief is rolling across the world, from Balmoral, where our thoughts are with all the royal family, and breaking far beyond this country and throughout the great Commonwealth of Nations that she so cherished and which cherished her in return. Uh, as is so natural with human beings, it is only when we face the reality of our loss that we truly understand what has gone. And it is only really now that we grasp how much she meant for us, how much she did for us, how much she loved us. Um, Boris Johnson continues, as we think of the void that she leaves, we understand the vital role that she played, selflessly and calmly embodying the continuity and unity of our country. We think of her deep vision, her wisdom, her historic understanding, her seemingly inexhaustible but understated sense of duty. Relentless, though her diary must have felt, she never once let it show. And to tens of thousands of events, uh, great and small, she brought her smile and her warmth and her gentle humour. For an unrivalled 70 years, she spread that magic throughout her kingdom. And then Boris Johnson ends his tribute like this. This is our country's saddest day because she had a unique and simple power to make us happy. And that is why we loved her. That is why we grieve for Elizabeth the Great, the longest serving and in many ways the finest monarch in our history. It was one of her best achievements that uh, she not only modernised the constitutional monarchy, but produced an heir to her throne who will amply do justice to her legacy and whose own sense of duty is in the best traditions of his mother and his country. Though our voices may still be choked with sadness, we can say with confidence the words not heard in this country for more than seven decades. God save the King. The words of Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, until a couple of days ago, and I'm bound to ask Nicholas Witchell, who's with me, um, that is quite a contrast to the tribute, the neat and uh, elegant and sincere tribute that the Prime Minister paid, but that is of a different order, isn't it? There is real feeling, isn't there? There is resonance in the mm. words from Boris Johnson. He has clearly thought about that a great deal. Yes, she seemed so timeless, he says, and that I think is what a lot of us will be feeling at this moment. And as he rightly says, we've not heard those words for 70 years, God save the King. Well, we have to adjust and get used to the reality of that situation now because yeah. that, uh, sadly, uh, as we mourn the passing of the Queen, we uh, accept that the head of state is now the King. But uh, yes, Boris Johnson, I think, capturing in those um, few hundred words what so many people, so many, many people, will be feeling just right now. Let's bring in our home editor, Mark Easton, because, Mark, um, you, again, are in a perfect place, really, given your brief, uh, to talk a little about the change that this represents. It's been called seismic, it's been called great, it's been called fundamental. How do you read the kind of process and impact of change that the Queen's death will produce? Well, Hugh, here at Buckingham Palace, you can see the way the public is already reacting. Thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of people have already turned up. Applause breaking out uh, just behind me now. People are pouring down the Mall, coming to pay their respects. Uh, King Charles III, as we must now learn to call him, talked about the respect and affection that the British people had for his mother. And you can feel that in the crowd here. Uh, it's a sombre atmosphere. Some people, I have to say, are close to tears. This was a very personal relationship with a woman who embodied something very special about their country. She was, I think, the keystone in the nation's architecture, the solid and immovable piece that sort of defined the nation's image of itself. And that is why I think when that, that keystone is removed, this is a very difficult and perhaps a dangerous moment for the United Kingdom. We've talked a lot about constancy uh, and consistency and, and, and the solidity that she brought to this country. Um, 
But I think that one shouldn't think that, that constancy is the same as inactivity. Because this was a queen, like a fish, swimming, keeping sort of still in a, in a, in a, in a fast-flowing stream. She remained uh, solid and, and still while everything was moving around her. And that required constant adaptation and change. And she put enormous thought into how she could, what she described as, ease the process of change for her people. People are arriving here. Her subjects are arriving at Buckingham Palace. Some have brought flowers uh, already. What's interesting, I think, about this crowd, I think it says something very important about uh, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, this is a crowd of every generation and every background. There are a lot of young people, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people from ethnic minorities. It's a very mixed crowd. And she was a queen that was able to, uh, to be a figurehead for people from whatever background in Britain. As I say, we've got tens of thousands of people here uh, already. I think this is going to become the focal point for uh, that national grief over the next uh, few days. Uh, and we, we will remember, some of us, the extraordinary scenes here after the death of Diana. Uh, and I think we will see something not dissimilar uh, with, the, with the loss of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, this is a huge moment for the country. I think it's going to be very difficult for people to adjust. I think that as well as sadness, people are feeling unsettled. And this was already at a time when there was quite a lot of foreboding about the winter to come. So I think this is going to be quite a moment for Britain and a time for people to pull together and support each other. Mark, thank you so much. Mark Easton with some thoughts there on uh, what this event, what this loss means for people across the UK and indeed uh, beyond. And as we look at these images, I have to say there are lots of very heartfelt and eloquent tributes being paid here in the UK and around the world. Uh, the former Prime Minister Sir John Major calling the Queen selfless and wise with a wonderful generosity of spirit. Um, and uh, he said he was greatly saddened the news of her death. The former Prime Minister Tony Blair, we've lost not just our monarch but the matriarch of our nation, the figure who more than any other brought our country together and kept us in touch with our better nature and personified everything which makes us proud to be British. And Mr Blair goes on, she was not only the respected and loved monarch, she was respected because of the uh, qualities of duty and decency and integrity and fidelity which she embodied uh, and loved because of the love and affection that she bestowed on us. And we will mourn her and we will miss her. That was Tony Blair speaking earlier on. Lots of other tributes from around the world. President Macron, the French president. Her Majesty the Queen embodied the British nation's continuity and unity for over 70 years. And President Macron says, I remember her as a friend of France, a kind-hearted queen who's left a lasting impression on her country and her century. And then President Zelensky of Ukraine, that troubled country, uh, sending this message on behalf of the Ukrainian people. We extend sincere condolences to the royal family, the entire UK and the Commonwealth over this irreparable loss. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. And then we have the German president too, uh, Herr Steinmeier, saying Queen Elizabeth was a woman who shaped a century and uh, Her Majesty enjoyed the highest respect in the whole world. A very concise statement, but one that conveys the uh, fundamental truth about uh, the uh, life and uh, the times. Um, let's think about the United States. There are statements from uh, President Trump, former President Trump, former President Obama, but I've just received this from President Biden. Uh, and this has just come in from the White House. So as we look at these images of the Queen's long life from her coronation back in 1953 all the way to this year in 2022. President Biden says, in a world of constant change, she was a steadying presence and a source of comfort and pride for generations of Britons, including many who've never known their country without her. 
And that is such a powerful theme today, as Nick and I have been discussing. An enduring admiration for Queen Elizabeth II united people across the Commonwealth. And the seven decades of her history-making reign bore witness to an age of unprecedented human advancement and the forward march of human dignity. She was the first British monarch, says President Biden, to whom people all around the world could feel a personal and immediate connection. And we see the crowds gathering at Buckingham Palace and they too, with their mobile devices, will be aware of lots of these tributes being paid um, as they gather there. And now that the formal announcement has been fixed to the main railings in front of the palace, as, as it is done at times of uh, great events like this, um, happy events and sad events. Uh, she was the first British monarch, says President Biden, to whom people all around the world could feel a personal and immediate uh, connection. Supported by her beloved Prince Philip, the Queen led always with grace, an unwavering commitment to duty and the incomparable power of her example. And uh, President Biden goes on to say she endured the dangers and the deprivations of a world war alongside the British people and rallied them during the devastation of a global pandemic to look to better days ahead. Queen Elizabeth II, this is how he concludes, was a stateswoman of unmatched dignity and constancy who deepened the bedrock alliance between the United Kingdom and the United States. She helped make our relationship special. And as a concluding thought, he says this. In the years ahead, we in the United States look forward to continuing a close friendship with the King and the Queen Consort. Today, the thoughts and prayers of people all across the United States are with the people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth in their grief. We send our deepest condolences to the royal family, who were not only mourning their Queen, but their dear mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, and her legacy will loom large in the pages of British history and in the story of the world. I have to say they're very moving tributes. I haven't uh, been able to come across uh, uh, a few of them yet because I know they're just waiting there for me from the Obamas and President Trump and other leaders, but they are moving, they are eloquent. Um, and Nick, they really do, they really do stop you in your tracks. And they, they just underline the fact that, you know, the appreciation for what the Queen achieved and what she represented is truly global. Uh, it's not, you know, we, we tend to talk about the Commonwealth. Of course, that's important. It's beyond that. As Boris Johnson said, it's only when you lose somebody that you really appreciate just who they were and how much you valued them. And the same words are in so many of these tributes, grace and duty and dignity and constancy. She was someone who personified um, simple qualities like decency and tolerance, who uh, encouraged politicians to be the best that they could be, who encouraged all of us really to be mm. the best of ourselves because she um, did embody those old fashioned concepts and she did that um, for decade after decade. And she was that most important thing for a monarch. She was someone, someone who unified people. She brought people together. Mm. And the challenge for Charles now will be to continue uh, to seek to do the same, particularly at this moment when there are pressures within the United Kingdom against unity. And so Charles, I think, will be very much aware of the challenges that he faces uh, and the uh, task that he must now begin. Well, Charles's younger son, Harry, uh, is, we understand, arriving at Balmoral just about now. Um, I'm, I think we're expecting the arrival in a few minutes. Um, here we are, the entrance to the Balmoral estate. But the Duke of Sussex, who's travelling alone, we believe, um, because uh, his wife, Meghan, is not accompanying him, but he's arriving. He's arriving. He didn't come with the main royal party earlier, with the Duke of Cambridge, his brother, uh, and with uh, Prince Andrew and with Prince Edward and the uh, Countess of Wessex. He wasn't with that group. They flew up to Aberdeen 
oh, quite a few hours ago. Um, and they've been in Balmoral since then. They joined the Princess Royal and the Prince of Wales, who were already there at the Queen's side. Um, so Prince Harry's arrival is considerably later than that. Uh, and indeed, it's uh, quite a while after the official announcement of the Queen's death at the age of 96. But um, we understand that uh, the Duke of Sussex, Harry, is uh, on his way there and he's about to arrive at Balmoral at this time where he will join the other members of the royal family. And as we've already heard, the King, King Charles III and the Queen Consort, um, they will be staying at Balmoral tonight. They're not returning to London tonight. We had that statement earlier from the King. Uh, and uh, they will be returning to London tomorrow. Um, we've also heard from the Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who paid her tribute to the Queen uh, and thanked her for a lifetime of service and reflected indeed the great sense of national sadness uh, at the news that came today because although the Queen was 96 and had health problems, um, these images will tell you everything about recent years where, of course, she's really just done her best to carry on despite advancing years and health problems. And she and Prince Philip, um, who left us two years ago, um, were full of the joys uh, during those uh, Jubilee celebrations. And now we have some of the tributes already arriving. Um, and they'll be arriving, of course, at Balmoral. They'll be arriving at uh, Buckingham Palace. They'll be arriving at Windsor. Um, so these will be local people who are used to the royal presence in Balmoral. They are very used to seeing the royal family around in these summer months. They know full well how fond the Queen was of Balmoral as a home and as a base. Um, and they will be wanting to pay their respects as locals. Locals who tended to leave the royal family alone because they were used to seeing them around. And the Queen certainly felt very much at home there, having spent so many years there with uh, with her family and indeed with her parents when she was uh, growing up. So sometime along this road we're expecting Prince Harry to arrive. Um, it's going to be in probably one of those uh, vehicles that we saw earlier, maybe a Range Rover or something of that kind, but uh, they're still expecting his arrival there. And uh, he will of course join the rest of the family and uh, they will no doubt be reflecting on the loss that they've suffered. They'll be sharing the sense of grief and they'll be thinking as well about what the future holds with the new king, King Charles III. As uh, Clarence House has confirmed, he wishes to be known King Charles III, um, who will be reigning with his queen consort Camilla uh, and thoughts already will be turning respectfully um, sensibly but respectfully towards the events of the next few days leading of course to the state funeral for Queen Elizabeth which will take place in probably 10 days time but we we need to have that confirmed. The plans of course have been there for a long time, they always are, they've been uh, revised over the years because that's how these things work um, but uh, they will need to be finalised given the circumstances because of course, the Queen has passed away at Balmoral in Scotland and uh, not at Windsor, not at Buckingham Palace. So the arrangements will inevitably be adjusted um, in the next few days in the lead up to the state funeral itself. Um, so there'll be some talk about that. And uh, it's, it's fine for us to talk a little bit about that. But what we're really doing today is reflecting on people's sense of loss and what's happened today. And the fact that British life has changed, the fact that the course of our history has changed, um, and that is symbolised by Buckingham Palace. And that empty balcony tonight, where the Queen has appeared on so many occasions, uh, on so many happy occasions indeed, um, during jubilees and the end of the Second World War with her beloved father and mother and sister Margaret. So it's been the scene of so many uh, great national events when uh, the crowds congregate around that palace to declare their support for the royal family or indeed to express their sympathy in bad times. And the crowds are now building up. The news 
which came uh, a short while ago, uh, clearly filtering through. And uh, lots of people now wanting to just stand at the palace, look at the palace, want to be seen at the palace to express their sense of loss and to express their sense of sympathy with the royal family, uh, with King Charles on the loss of his mother, and of course with uh, the uh, Duke of York and the Earl of Wessex and the Princess Royal, who've also lost a mother, and the Duke of Cambridge, who's lost his grandmother, as has the Duke of Sussex, who's on his way to Balmoral. Um, of course, a grandmother and a great-grandmother too. So there's, uh, there's generations of the royal family affected by the news today. That's before you start thinking about friends of the royal family and about generations of people in the UK who've known nothing else. You'd have to be in your 80s, basically, uh, to be in any position to say that you could perhaps remember a time when the Queen wasn't sovereign, wasn't the monarch. And here we have dusk in London and the Queen Victoria Memorial glinting uh, in the evening light um, with the crowds gathering around that memorial and uh, congregating at the gates and the railings of Buckingham Palace. The palace which is of course the symbol of the royal family in central London but uh, is not the usual residence of the royal family. That is Windsor Castle um, which is usually a short ride away in a helicopter or indeed a car and the Queen used to uh, be very familiar with that journey being ferried back and forth from Windsor to Buckingham pa um, Palace for the business of the day and then of course Buckingham Palace the great backdrop for so many of the huge ceremonial and state events that we are familiar with and they include the Queen's birthday parade which will become the King's birthday parade when that next happens and that famous processional route along the Mall all the way to Horse Guards Parade with the Queen until the mid-1980s was uh, on horseback. Uh, she loved the horses, of course, as we know, not just riding, but also the horse racing, um, on that processional route for so many birthday parades uh, and uh, indeed was in a position to enjoy the end of the parade um, in 2022 for the Platinum Jubilee. So, so many happy memories and the crowds gathering are aware of them, but on a day when they're reflecting on a huge loss in our national life, the death of Queen Elizabeth II, who's died at the age of 96. Um, I'm in a position to tell you what the leader of the opposition has been saying, uh, Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, has issued his own statement in the past uh, half hour or so. Um, we mourn the passing of a remarkable sovereign, says Sir Keir. It's a deep private loss for the royal family and all our thoughts are with them at this time and the nation shares in their grief. Uh, we will always treasure Queen Elizabeth II's life of service and devotion to our nation and the Commonwealth. Our longest serving and our greatest monarch, says Sir Keir. Above the clashes of politics, she stood not for what the nation fought over, but what it agreed upon. As Britain changed rapidly around her, this dedication became the still point of our turning world. So as our great Elizabethan era comes to an end, we will honour the late Queen's memory by keeping alive the values of public service that she embodied. For 70 years, Sir Keir Starmer says, Queen Elizabeth II stood as the head of our country. But in spirit, she stood amongst us. Yet another moving tribute from our leaders. There one from Boris Johnson earlier and Liz Truss, and this one from Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader. There are others too, of course, from President Biden, President Obama, former President Trump, President Macron. Uh, all of these tributes coming in, all of them worth reading. They will no doubt be on the BBC News website uh, for you to see, to just keep up with the tributes being paid because they are moving, they're eloquent and they are thoughtful. And uh, it's well worth you having a look if you have a moment to do that. Now you're watching BBC News and uh, this extended coverage continues this evening 
on the 8th of September 2022 because Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest serving monarch in the history of the United Kingdom, the commanding presence in British public life for a span of eight decades. The flags have been lowered at Buckingham Palace. The Queen died at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire at the age of 96. And the Queen's eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has formally become King Charles III. And within the past few minutes, Buckingham Palace released this formal statement. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. And Charles, the new King, said this, the death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. It's uh, coming up to eight o'clock in the evening. The lights are on in central London. The flags have been lowered. The crowds are gathering around the memorial by Buckingham Palace. Nicholas Witchell, our Royal Correspondent, still with me. And up at Balmoral, we are in a position to say that Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, is either just about to arrive or has just arrived. He's certainly within minutes of arriving at Balmoral Castle itself. Uh, some of the vehicles now pulling up, and they are the, uh, the advanced vehicles, and there's the vehicle, uh, the cavalcade, moving its way into Balmoral Castle itself, and we believe that is uh, Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, and uh, Nick, you're watching this with me, and uh, that means that Harry has now joined his brother yes. and his father and other members of the family. Yes, as autumn descends on this bleak September day, there at Balmoral and also at Buckingham Palace, how striking are those images outside the palace, people feeling the need to come together at this moment in the nation's history, uh, the day on which the Queen of the last 70 years has passed away. People need, I think, just to the, the solace, the comfort of being with other people. The nation will begin its mourning, bells will be rung and guns will be sounded and church services will come together. I remember the words that were, were used, I think, by a previous Archbishop of Canterbury who talked about service untiringly done, duty faithfully fulfilled. Everyone will have their words about the reign, the duty of Elizabeth II, as we all just pay our tributes now to a life of duty, of humility, of decency, as the process, the transition now to this new reign gets underway. And I expect we will hear from the new king tomorrow uh, there will also, of course, be an accession council when the Privy Council comes together. Yes. Uh, not the full Privy Council, because there simply isn't room these days, but they will come together and they will confirm the succession and they will, I imagine, at some point hear from the new king. And those statements by him will be important to set the tone for his reign paying tribute to his mother on behalf of his family and the nation, but also setting out his aspirations, his wish, his ambition to be a force for unity and continuity and stability at a time when stability perhaps is in rather yeah. shorter supply than it has been at many other times. It is unsettling, as Mark Easton said. It is disorientating, and many people will, will feel that, and they will need to be reassured at this moment. Nick, thanks again. Nicholas Witchell, our Royal Correspondent, with some thoughts there on the significance of today and the loss that people have suffered today and the country has suffered and the fact that we no longer have a Queen. 
uh, we have a king, King Charles III, uh, who has acceded to the throne immediately, um, the moment that his mother passed away. Lots of tributes uh, which we can still share with you from uh, political leaders, from religious leaders. For example, um, the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, who saw the Queen so many times, of course, during her period as Prime Minister, um, simply said this, I want to place on record, says Theresa May, that Her Majesty devoted herself unreservedly to a life of service. And uh, that really does echo um, what uh, so many others have been saying. Um, it's interesting as well that the Duke of Cambridge, um, a new title, the Duke of Cambridge, the Duchess of Cambridge, William and Kate, of course, now being referred to um, by as the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and Cambridge. So we'll see lots of these adjustments as uh, the evening goes on. And here on BBC News, we will, of course, be bringing you more tributes from around the world and reflecting what people in communities across the United Kingdom are saying tonight after the death of the Queen. We'll take a pause for now. We'll be back for an extended edition of BBC News at 10. But uh, we're going to join my colleague Clive Myrie now for more special coverage following the death of Her Majesty the Queen. Goodbye for now. The longest reigning monarch in British history, Queen Elizabeth II, has died at the age of 96. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. God help me to make good my vow. Over the course of eight momentous decades, she witnessed social and economic change on a global scale. As Princess Elizabeth of York, she came to the throne at the age of 25, following the sudden death of her father, King George VI. During her lifelong reign, the Queen dealt with no fewer than 15 Prime Ministers. The first, Sir Winston Churchill, through to Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair and Boris Johnson. As head of the Commonwealth, she became the most travelled monarch in history, head of state of 15 countries at the end of her reign. The Queen's death comes just over a year after the passing of her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, her consort for more than 70 years. Over the decades, the Queen was greeted by millions of people worldwide and met her subjects on thousands of engagements in the UK and well beyond. She was last pictured at Balmoral on Tuesday, asking Liz Truss to become Prime Minister. Now, as the crown passes to a new king, Charles III, the Queen's death will be deeply felt by her family, by people across the United Kingdom and millions around the world. 
Good evening. The reign of the longest serving monarch in the history of the United Kingdom has come to an end with the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Buckingham Palace made the announcement just after 6.30 this evening. The Queen, who was 96, passed away at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire. Members of the royal family had made the journey there on the news she was gravely ill. The Queen had been a commanding presence in British public life for more than eight decades and her eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has now become King Charles III. Buckingham Palace had issued this statement. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. Well, in the last hour, His Majesty King Charles III released this statement. The death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. Well, joining me now is Nicholas Witchell, our Royal Correspondent. Nick, I am 58 years of age. I've known no other monarch. And there are millions of people, we'll show the pictures a little bit later on, Millions of people around the country, thousands outside Buckingham Palace, some outside Balmoral as well. They have known no other monarch either. This is a moment of profound change as well as profound sadness. It is. It's a massive moment for the country and I think um, people are just taking it in, absorbing it. And I would imagine that many millions of people are very emotional uh, about this. Uh, the tears will flow uh, in many households tonight as they just um, take in the news that uh, this figure who has been there throughout most of our lives, in the background to our lives, I'm nearly 70 and I too have only ever mm. known Elizabeth II on the throne. Uh, but the transition will take place. We have a new king. The crown passes imperceptibly, invisibly, immediately. Mm. He doesn't have to be sworn in. There doesn't have to be any ceremony to uh, uh, ensure that he is the new monarch. He is, as soon as one monarch dies, the crown passes. Mm. There will be challenges for him, there is no doubt. Um, anyone succeeding to such a huge figure who has occupied the throne for so long would face quite a challenging time to uh, take up and pick up the threads of, um, of the constitutional monarchy in this country. But I think that this nation is, at its heart, um, feels very comfortable with the monarchy. Not everybody does. Mm. There are many people, of course, who don't, but the overwhelming majority do. And I think that um, Charles will rely on those instincts and the efforts that he will make in coming days to reassure people that he will reign in the style of his mother. There will be some differences because each monarch has an element of their own personality. He will be, I think, slightly more proactive than she was. But that's all for the future, really. Um, tonight, millions of people in this country and around the world will be reflecting back and feeling a deep and profound sadness. We'll be just appreciating what it is that has been lost to the United Kingdom. The monarch who has been so dutiful, who has embodied all the best of qualities of tolerance and decency, who has stood for unity and uh, constancy and continuity. That reign has ended um, and it is a moment of great sadness and solemnity for, for the United Kingdom. For the United Kingdom and indeed her own family. Nick, for now, thank you very much indeed. Let's go to our Scotland editor, James Cook, who is at Balmoral for us now. James, um, what can we say, really? Um, members of the family are there. Um, and by uh, Her Majesty's bedside, when she passed away, we assume 
Um, are all the immediate members of the family now with you? Uh, yes, uh, all the senior royals have all arrived here. Uh, within the past half an hour or so, the sun, shrouded in cloud, set here on the Balmoral estate, setting too on the end of an era for the United Kingdom and for the world. And minutes after it did so, a car swept through the gate, several cars in fact, one of them we believe containing Prince Harry to join his brother, Prince William, and his father, the King, in mourning for Queen Elizabeth. Uh, a monarch who has a special place in the heart of this nation, but who in return had, in her own words, a deep and abiding affection for Scotland. Uh, a moment, of course, here behind these gates for a family, first and foremost to mourn, but a moment too for a nation to reflect, to reflect on an extraordinary reign and on the end, the severing of links with the Second World War, the existential threat to this country which this nation survived, and also to the British Empire, which in many ways the Queen embodied for some of her reign. She also, I think it is fair to say, embodied the union of the crowns between Scotland and England, that union dating all the way back to 1603. James, thank you. Our Scotland editor there live at Balmoral. Um, we can go now to Mark Easton, who is outside Buckingham Palace for us. Now, Mark, we were seeing a little bit earlier some of the pictures of the crowds gathered where you are, uh, many of them having been there in the rain throughout much of the day on the news that the Queen was gravely ill. Um, and now many more people have turned up on the news that she has now passed away. Yes, absolutely, Clive. People are, are seeking some way of connecting with this extraordinary moment in British history. And despite the rain, which is really quite heavy now. Um, there are tens of thousands of people outside Buckingham Palace. The crowd has been growing over the last few hours, people streaming down the Mall. In the Mall as well, we've got a line of black taxi cabs. Uh, the, the cabbies wanting to pay their tribute. It's a very respectful, very sombre scene. Um, you'll see quite a few camera lights are on. But I've also heard applause and even at one point three cheers. Now we don't know whether those were moments of where the crowd wanted to show their appreciation for the Queen that they have lost or whether they were perhaps greeting their new King, King Charles III. Um, but whichever, it is a crowd which wants to be part of this moment. And it's, it is a huge moment, I think, Clive, for this country because the Queen was this solid, immovable piece of the nation's architecture, the keystone. Uh, and, and without that, uh, there will be a sense, I think, of unease, of uncertainty. Uh, and, 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 and it is in a moment when people will want to come together, will want to, to be with others, to share this moment and to see it through. Mark, thank you. Mark Easton there at Buckingham Palace this evening, where crowds... Uh, have gathered uh, and have been gathering throughout the day. Um, if you are just joining us, Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest serving monarch in the history of the United Kingdom and a commanding presence, of course, in British public life over eight decades. Her Majesty died at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire and she was aged 96. The Queen's eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has now become king. Our royal correspondent Daniela Ralph now looks back on today's events. Tuesday the 6th of September, the last photographs of the Queen, 96 years old and still at work. Meeting the new Prime Minister at Balmoral, a duty she had been keen to fulfil and one we now know was her final duty after seven decades of public service. Around four o'clock this afternoon, a number of the Queen's family arrived at Aberdeen Airport. Her grandson, the Duke of Cambridge, was first to emerge, followed by her daughter-in-law, Sophie, the Countess of Wessex. 
and then her two youngest sons, Edward, the Earl of Wessex, and Andrew, the Duke of York. Prince William drove the family group to Balmoral to join his father, the Prince of Wales, Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, and Princess Anne, who were already there with the Queen. Within an hour and a half of their arrival came news from Buckingham Palace. As is tradition, the announcement of the Queen's death was attached to the palace gates by two footmen, as tributes began. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. She was the very spirit of Great Britain, and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. And also from the leader of the opposition. For the vast majority of us, the late Queen has been simply the Queen, the only Queen, above all else, our Queen. As we mourn her loss, we should also treasure her life, our longest serving and greatest ever monarch. Above the clashes of politics, she stood not for what the nation fought over, but what it agreed upon. Throughout the day, there had been growing unease about the Queen's health. In the Commons, as Keir Starmer stood up to speak, opposite him, the Prime Minister was being told of the Queen's condition. Information passed to Angela Rayner, Labour's deputy leader, who left her seat for a while to discuss the development, before the Speaker of the House addressed the chamber. I know I speak on behalf of the entire House when I say that we send our best, best wishes to Her Majesty the Queen and that she and the Royal Family are in our thoughts and prayers at this moment. Cheered by onlookers, one of the Queen's last royal engagements was in July, with her daughter, Princess Anne, opening a new state-of-the-art hospice in Berkshire. But these kind of visits had become rare over the past year. As the Queen relied on her walking stick, her mobility compromised. The royal household had tried to adapt to keep her active and visible. A golf buggy at the Chelsea Flower Show helped keep the Queen comfortable. But she had become noticeably thinner and frailer, something that severely limited her involvement in her own Platinum Jubilee celebrations, with her family increasingly representing her. At the weekend, her son stood in at the Braemar Highland Games, always a favourite event for the Queen that she reluctantly missed. Like so much of her life, the decline in her health was played out in public. Duty may have got harder to manage physically, but mentally, even emotionally, the Queen remained engaged and working to the very end. Daniela Ralph with a sum up there of uh, the events of the day. We're now joined by the former Conservative Prime Minister, Sir John Major. Sir John, it's very good of you to join us here on BBC News um, at this moment in time. Fears, of course, um, had been mounting throughout the day on the news uh, from the Queen's medical team at Balmoral. What are your thoughts now on the passing of Her Majesty? Well, it is heartbreaking news. It's news that one day we knew we would have, but we always hoped it would be delayed and would be some way away. It's very hard to take it in, that, that radiant smile which lights up a room and lights up a country is just not going to be live for us there anymore. Very hard to imagine. Most of the people in this country can remember nothing other than the Queen as monarch. Many of those who are elderly remember faintly the former King. But this is an enormous change for this country. It's a very big moment in history, a key pivotal moment. And I think there will be many tears shed tonight and over the next few days uh, for Her Majesty the Queen. Mm. I wonder, Sir John, um, given your interactions with the Queen, obviously, as Prime Minister, what your personal recollections are of meeting her? 
there are so many recollections and in many ways so different from what people might imagine. The private meetings that the Prime Minister has with the Queen, which are perhaps scheduled for 45 minutes, in my experience never lasted uh, uh, remotely under an hour and often some way beyond it, which weren't entirely serious matters, just discussing the, uh, the matters of the nation. There was a great deal of amusement in them, there was a great deal of humour in them, there was a bit of gossip in them. And apart from that, the serious matters that were discussed, I think people would have been extraordinarily surprised if they realised the depth of information the Queen had about the lives of people uh, in every conceivable part of the United Kingdom. She was always extraordinarily well briefed. And on foreign affairs, of course, uh, she would often say if there was a difficulty of a foreign leader, well, I met him many years ago, or even I knew his father. There was always a wise word to be had. And those meetings with the Queen are one of the better parts of a Prime Minister's week. Mm. I mean, that stability, that continuity that she brought, um, not just to the monarchy, I suppose, but to, to all of our lives um, on being on the throne over such a long period. Um, what are your thoughts on that now that she's passed? Well, the continuity was very important, but I think there were other things as well. Mm. The example, the duty, the selflessness, the way in which other people were put first, the way in which we hand, she handled crisis with great stoicism when they occurred, as they occurred a number of times during her reign. They were all examples to people about how to behave in their own lives and examples for our country. And what you found going around the world is that the Queen was the face of the United Kingdom. When people around the world spoke of the Queen, they actually meant our Queen. That was the status she had in every part of the world. It was truly remarkable. Mm. So, John, you talked about the stoicism she showed in times of crisis. We think back, of course, to 1992 and her Anna Horribilis speech, the fire at Windsor Castle as well, her fortitude in dealing with those issues and those problems was something that the British people came to admire greatly in her, along with that sense of duty. I think they were right to admire it. Um, I sat uh, one belong from, uh, along from her when she made the Annus Horribilis speech in uh, 1992. A great deal had gone wrong and there was, as you say, that dreadful fire in, in Windsor Castle, which many people didn't receive with the sympathy perhaps they should have done. Uh, but the Queen understood that. She put her head down and she quietly, silently, uncomplainingly got on with her job. There are very few people who would have handled it with the aplomb that she did. And I think that was uh, in part because of her experience and in part because of her natural nature. She knew what one had to do to be a monarch. She knew when to keep out of controversy. She knew when to advise in private. She was almost faultless in the way in which she conducted the monarchy. Mm. And she leaves behind the monarchy in very good shape and a son who's been brought up to follow in precisely the same footsteps as King Charles III. I wonder too, Sir John, about the affection with which she was held right around the world, particularly within the Commonwealth. And you travelled and you've seen the great affection that she had and there will be millions across the globe now who will be particularly sad today. Well, I have seen that affection at close quarters. Um, some 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I was invited by the Queen to set up and chair the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust, a charity to commemorate her 60 years on the throne. And we raised money from across the Commonwealth and I asked the Queen what she wished us to do with the money that we had raised in her name. And she gave us two tasks. The first was to cure avoidable blindness across the whole of the Commonwealth. And the second was to seek out young Commonwealth leaders in every nation of the Commonwealth, 54 at the time, and help prepare them for leadership roles in later life. It was entirely a selfless request on her behalf and entirely typical of her. Remarkable. Sir John Major, thank you very much indeed for giving us your reflections on Queen Elizabeth II, who passed away today. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to go to Buckingham Palace. There we are, live pictures there, the lights lining up the front, and crowds of people. A bit difficult to make out, but you can see the odd umbrella there, the rain still coming down, flashlights from 
people taking pictures and of course the press gathered there and we're thinking around about a few hundred people possibly even more on the news that the Queen has died that notice from Buckingham Palace announcing the news posted around about 6.40, 6.45 today I think the official announcement coming from Buckingham Palace that the Queen had died came just after 6.30 and it was after a RAF plane arrived on the tarmac at Aberdeenshire Airport to take members of the royal family to the Queen's bedside at Balmoral Castle. And uh, these still the scenes. And you can see we've got a bit more light there now. You can see how many people have gathered. Quite a few. Even the rain, even with the rain pouring down there. Many people wanting to pay their respects. Many people fearing the worst, of course, after that rather alarming bulletin from the Queen's medical team coming out of Balmoral in Scotland just after 12.30 today, saying that there was concern over the Queen's health, but that she was comfortable while she was in the castle. And of course, a good few hours later, we got the news that the Queen had passed away. the very latest scenes there, outside Buckingham Palace. While well, the Queen spent much of the past few years at Windsor Castle, of course, living and working there throughout the coronavirus pandemic. Our correspondent, Adina Campbell, is there for us now. Adina, we've just seen the pictures outside Buckingham Palace. Hundreds of people, probably thousands of people out there gathered. Uh, what is the scene like where you are? Well, hundreds of people have gathered here in Windsor tonight. Nearby, close to the high street, others near the historic Long Walk. People of all ages, families have come out with young children, local residents, tourists have all come together to mark this day. And they've been paying their respects. Plenty have been leaving flowers. You may be able to see some of those floral tributes behind me. And others have lit candles. There was a poignant moment shortly after the announcement was made when a rainbow came out in the sky and that's when people stood still. They were silent, they were reflective and the news really then sunk in. And that happened shortly after the flag had been lowered, not quite at half mast, but it had been lowered. This is a community that has had a deep, close connection with the Queen for many years. This was her main residence. She had spent a great deal of time here, particularly over the last 12 months since she started experiencing those episodic mobility problems. And then, of course, she had spent a long time here with the Duke of Edinburgh before he died in April last year. They had been isolating here. People here are experiencing a sense of loss here tonight in Windsor. We've seen some emotional people, people who have been able, unable to hold back tears consoling each other, hugging each other. And of course, we know that this is a town that has rich royal roots. Just recently, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have moved here. We know the Duke of Cambridge is up in Balmoral, but we know tonight the Duchess of Cambridge is looking after their three young children because they started their first full day at, at school. So this is a community in shock. They are sad and it's a community in mourning. Adina, thank you. Adina Campbell there outside uh, Windsor Castle. Perhaps um, the Queen's favourite residence, her main residence. Um, and the scenes out there, of course, scores and scores of people paying their respects outside the building. Well, as we've been hearing, our new Prime Minister Liz Truss has led the tributes to Queen Elizabeth, saying she was loved and admired by people around the world and describing her as the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our political editor Chris Mason is in Downing Street now. Chris, um, we know that there was a discussion in Parliament today over the appalling cost of living crisis. That news and that debate overshadowed 
by the situation concerning the Queen. And I wonder now, given the stability that the Queen not only brought to the rest of British society, but also to the political life of this country, um, that is now um, sadly gone. It has, Clive, yeah. And I think what we witnessed at lunchtime caught in a moment the very nature of the British Constitution, the, the way that we are governed. Because there in the House of Commons was a debate ongoing where the House of Commons does what it is famous for, that it is the fulcrum of our democracy. It is the fulcrum and apex of angry argument to determine how we are governed. And there was that passionate argument going on uh, about this whole huge and profound issue of energy bills, the government setting out its programme, the opposition criticising it, and then the passage of messages along the line, along the two front benches from a government minister to the deputy leader of the Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer, the leader, was on his feet at the time, and also to the Prime Minister. And you could tell, watching the chamber, you could tell the gravity of the news that was being passed on some eight or nine hours ago at lunchtime as senior politicians uh, learned of the deteriorating health uh, of the Queen. We've seen and heard, haven't we, in the conversation you just had with uh, Sir John Major, the reflections of senior politicians on the value that they attached to their conversations with the Queen, the nature of that constitutional settlement I was talking about, meaning that the Queen is, if you like, plugged into democracy but stands above it. And through that mechanism of the weekly audiences, Prime Ministers, 15 uh, in total, Liz Truss only having that one audience with the Queen that moment 48 hours ago when she became Prime Minister, having the chance every week to go and see the Queen in private and tap into what David Cameron, one of her Prime Ministers, her 12th Prime Minister, uh, saying this evening was the world's greatest public servant and the world's most experienced diplomat, tapping into that wisdom and counsel, knowing whatever advice was offered would be done so privately. Indeed. OK. Chris, thank you. Our political editor there, live at Downing Street. Uh, we were talking to uh, Sir John Major a little bit earlier. Um, the one of 15 Prime Ministers, of course, uh, that the Queen uh, interacted with Liz Truss, the latest, um, whom she asked to become Prime Minister earlier this week. And if you're joining us um, for the first time, I should tell you that Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Her Majesty died at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire at the age of 96. Now, the Queen's eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has now become king. In a statement, Buckingham Palace said, the Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and Queen consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. And following the death of his mother, His Majesty King Charles III released this statement. The death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. Um, we've got live pictures for you um, coming in at Buckingham Palace. Um, again, that is the scene where it's a little bit difficult to make out, but there are many, many members of the public there paying their respects. They've been gathering throughout the day on the news a little after lunchtime of concerns of the Queen's health made by her medical team at Balmoral. Of course, the kissing of the hands, the ceremony in which the prospective Prime Minister assumes the position had to take place at Balmoral because the Queen was unable to travel down to London. That was, of course, with Liz Truss earlier this week. 
And one assumes the reasoning behind her not being able to travel to London was part of the drama of events earlier on today. But those pictures, the very latest outside Buckingham Palace, where around 6.40 this evening, that notice was posted on the railings from Buckingham Palace, making it clear that the Queen had died peacefully. Well, the Queen was the longest serving monarch in the history of the United Kingdom and held a commanding presence in public life across the UK over eight decades. Tonight, people have been reacting to the news of her sudden passing and Lucy Manning has more. She was long to reign over us, almost all of her life, and for most here, all of theirs. Through the streets of London, they streamed to pay tribute to our Queen. What's your reaction to the news? Oh, I'm so sad because she was a wonderful lady. She dedicated her whole life to the nation, and we could just thank her for it. And we feel for her family today. Um, it's a very sad day. I'm so sad because she was a lovely, beautiful lady, beautiful mother, a beautiful grandmother. Could just she had many to take her for her. She was very much loved. There is a real sense that this queen was a history maker. It's devastating. She's going to be missed by so many people. She affected so many lives, and she was an absolutely amazing monarch. And what did she mean to you? Well, I think as, as a woman, it's amazing to see a, woman, a female at the helm of our country and why I might not ever get the chance to see another woman as queen. She meant everything to, to me, my family, um, you know, a sense of community, you know, loyalty, um, you know, giving back to communities, um, serving, you know, the community as a whole. Um, so she meant a lot to, to everyone here today. I think, you know, the biggest thing that I'll remember is, you know, her sense of sort of charity, giving back. The crowds used to gather here in their hundreds of thousands to see the Queen on the Buckingham Palace balcony. As soon as her death was announced, they came back. There is a hush here, as the one constant in the country's life is no more. In the place where she died, Balmoral, the locals were enormously proud of their regal visitor who joined them each year. Just very sad. It's just been a monarch for over 70 years and it's, it's history and we just wanted to be here to share our condolences to the fact, like, just be part of it kind of thing, yeah. It's really sad news to hear actually, it's, uh, that's the reason we came, we were hoping to pass on our regards or just to be here, so it's kind of sad actually. A sad day? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, for everybody I think, you know, I think the whole nation will come together and just, you know feel the same. Yeah. Although, you know, you, don't, you, you never knew her or anything, but her significance was, was just incredible. And it doesn't really hit home, I don't think, until you hear something like this. And um, what she meant to us and what she meant to the country was absolutely incredible legacy. At Buckingham Palace, no one here truthfully is sure what to do. But they know they want to be here, to stand, to mark the moment, to bring flowers to remember. Her kingdom is united, in sorrow, yes, but also in admiration in the sense that we have been fortunate to live in her era. Through change and turmoil, there has always been the Queen. Lucy Manning, BBC News, Buckingham Palace. Lucy there talking about flowers marking the moment uh, at Buckingham Palace. These are live pictures at Windsor Castle and there, more floral tributes. Um, lit by a candle at the front there, as people remember. For many of them, the only monarch they've ever known. I began this broadcast a few minutes ago, pointing out that I've known no other, no other queen at the age of 58, and those little, those little children there. They're now going to be growing up in a world where it is Charles III who will be their sovereign and uh, people turning up continually throughout the evening as the light has dimmed. The flashlights there in the corner there of some of the press who've recorded this moment 
as well and continuing flowers being put down there as people remember. Um, we're going to go back to Buckingham Palace too. I'll show you the live pictures there. Um, in the darkness, hundreds of people, at least hundreds, but I suspect possibly even thousands have gathered there now. And um, there they are. The rain's still, still coming down. It's been raining throughout the day. And despite that, people have been willing to, to deal with the elements. Their umbrellas there bobbing about in the wind, as many of them reflect on a life of extraordinary selflessness and grit to a degree through some of the trials and tribulations of her own family, it has to be said. And you can get a much clearer sense of the rain pouring down there in the lights outside Buckingham Palace, right in the heart of central London. Well, it was in Scotland where the Queen passed away and political leaders there have been paying tribute to the monarch. In the last few minutes, Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, described the Queen's death as a profoundly sad moment, describing her life as one of extraordinary dedication and service. Let's go now to Sarah Smith at Holyrood in Edinburgh. Sarah, um, what else have you been hearing from the political establishment in Scotland? Well, already people here are turning up at Holyrood Palace, the Queen's official residence in Edinburgh, with flowers to pay their respects. And we're hearing of their sorrow and sadness at the passing of Queen Elizabeth and political leaders all joining in with that sentiment. And it's partly because the Queen had a really very obvious affection for Scotland. And that's one that was reciprocated by many, many people here. It was just last year at the opening of the Scottish Parliament when Scotland's politicians were all gathered there together that she talked to them of her deep and abiding affection for this wonderful country, she called it. And she spoke of the many, many happy memories her and Prince Philip had shared in Scotland. She came here frequently as a child before she was Queen and her first official visit to Scotland as the monarch took place just three weeks after the coronation when she and her husband came here to Edinburgh and toured through the streets and he was of course the Duke of Edinburgh. And then in the decades since then she was a very frequent visitor. Every summer she would come and spend a week here at Holyrood Palace before going up to Balmoral. She would take part in all sorts of official engagements including hosting every summer a garden party for thousands of Scots to be invited to it. And it's because of these connections that politicians here are saying that they feel so profoundly sad like the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. For more than 70 years, Queen Elizabeth has been the great constant in our national life. She has inspired us, on occasion comforted us, and always personified values we hold dear. Throughout her reign, she performed her duties with exceptional wisdom, dedication and fidelity. Scotland loved, respected and admired her. And by all accounts, Her Majesty was really happier than when she was here in Scotland at her beloved Balmoral, a fact I have been privileged to observe personally. I hope it will be a source of comfort to her family that she spent her final days in a place that she loved so much. Nicola Sturgeon there talking about the respect and admiration that she felt for the Queen, partly because of her affection for Scotland, but also because of her sense of service and duty. And that's why we're hearing politicians from all sides of the political spectrum absolutely agreed that they owe a great debt to the monarch who served the country so well for so very many years. I think it's notable here in Scotland as well that throughout the years of debate that there have been about Scottish independence, the SNP were always at pains to stress that the Queen would remain the head of state if Scotland ever were to become independent. That's because they feared it would be a vote loser if they were to suggest that an independent Scotland would cut ties with the royal family. That's a, a measure of the affection and the respect that the Queen was given here in Scotland. Indeed, Sarah, thank you for that. Sarah Smith there at uh, Holyrood, the Queen's official residents uh, in Edinburgh. Um, actually, the Queen had more 
Scottish monarchs in her ancestry than English ones. Um, so that's an interesting thought to ponder there. Um, we're going to go to some more floral tributes uh, being placed outside Windsor. This is the scene this evening. Um, a few candles as well have been lit there. Um, Windsor, perhaps the Queen's favourite residence and her main residence. Uh, we talked a little bit to Sir John Major uh, about the Queen's fortitude and strength during that awful fire that engulfed the castle and how she coped with that and simply got on with things. And it's that sense of duty um, and strength that has come to be admired by so many people throughout her long reign and now will be sorely missed by many people, not just in this country, but quite frankly, right around the world and more people there this evening. What time is it? Quarter to nine, coming out. The rain has held off there. It's very rainy down in Buckingham Palace, but there people still making and marking their respects to our departed, departed Queen. And this is the scene outside Buckingham Palace tonight. As we've been seeing throughout the evening, many more people turning up there as well. Some people perhaps hearing the news for the first time um, and deciding that perhaps they need to do something that is important to them in perhaps laying flowers outside one of the official royal residences and there, despite that rain teeming down, it's been bucketing it down for much of the day, frankly, but still, so many people have been wanting to get out there and mark this incredible moment in British history. And um, in Northern Ireland, leaders across the political spectrum have been paying their tributes to the Queen, praising her efforts to advance peace and reconciliation. Our Ireland correspondent Chris Page is live at Stormont for us now. Chris, um, just sum up what you've been hearing from those people who have been marking the Queen's death with their own messages. Yes, Clive, here at Stormont, the home of the Northern Ireland Assembly, Two flags are flying at half-mast on top of the building and senior politicians have been expressing their condolences to the royal family and paying their tributes. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, has said Queen Elizabeth II was a steadfast and unshakable head of state. At the other end of the political spectrum, so to speak, the leader of the Irish Nationalist Party, Sinn Féin here, Michelle O'Neill, has said she learned of the Queen's passing with deep regret. For about 30 of the Queen's 70 years on the throne, Northern Ireland was perhaps the most troubled part of her realm. And the conflict known as the Troubles touched the Queen most personally and painfully, perhaps in 1979, when her cousin, Lord Mountbatten, was murdered by the IRA. Later, the Queen made some defining contributions to the peace process, most notably in 2011, when she became the first British monarch to carry out a state visit to the Republic of Ireland. A year later, there was another highly symbolic and powerful gesture, when she shook hands with a former IRA commander, the late Martin McGuinness, who is a Sinn Féin politician, had become the joint head of the power-sharing devolved government. So I think it is those moments in particular that people in Northern Ireland will be reflecting on as they consider Her Majesty's legacy on this sad day over the coming days and, of course, for many decades to come. Indeed. OK. Chris, thank you for that. Chris Page there, our Ireland correspondent outside Stormont, joining us there. This is seen back at Buckingham Palace. And the place where, at around 6.40 this evening, that notice was posted by the palace announcing the death of Her Majesty the Queen a few hundred miles further north in Scotland, of course, at Balmoral Castle. And more and more people, it seems, over the last, what, hour or so, have been turning up, um, umbrellas in hand, in the middle of all that rain, to pay tributes to... For many of them, the only monarch that they've ever known. And now, 
of course, we have a new king, and that is Charles III. He was, of course, the Prince of Wales, and the tributes there have come from the First Minister, Mark Drakeford, and we can bring in our correspondent, Hal Griffith, to talk to us now. Hal, um, just sum up, will you please, some of the thoughts of the leaders there where you are and the thoughts of, of the people of Wales, um, not only on the passing of Her Majesty, but also, of course, the now Charles III. Yes, Clive, well, I'm here at the Senev and we've seen people coming to lay flowers here too. The flags have been lowered. This is actually where the Queen made her final visit to Wales back in October last year. Opening the Senev, the Welsh Parliament, for the sixth time. She was a repeat visitor here. She opened what was then the first National Assembly uh, back in 1999, lending, some people argue, a sense of legitimacy to this growing institution. The tributes to her, not surprisingly, maybe have been led by the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, who spoke uh, about an hour or so ago. It is with great sadness that we learn today of the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. She has been the only monarch that most of us will remember, and today the country feels an immense loss. Throughout her long and exceptional life, as our longest reigning monarch, Her Majesty firmly upheld the values and traditions of the British monarchy. On behalf of the Welsh Government and people in all parts of Wales, I offer our deepest condolences to all Her Majesty's children and their families on this sad occasion. Well, lots of people I've spoken to have talked about how she oversaw a huge period of change in national life here in Wales, not just a new Senedd, but people saying she gave a sense of welcome to people of all nations and all faiths as she uh, reigned for such a long time. Howell, thank you for that. Howell Griffith there, outside the uh, Senedd uh, in Cardiff. Well, as we know, the Queen was not only the monarch for the United Kingdom, but she was also the head of state across 14 other Commonwealth countries. So, how has the news been received right around the world? Our diplomatic correspondent James Landale has been looking at the international response to the Queen's passing. From the moment the Queen's reign began in Kenya in 1952, she played a constant and significant role on the international stage. And this afternoon there was sorrow and regret expressed around the world, including at the White House. You know, our hearts and our thoughts uh, go to uh, the family members uh, of the Queen, um, goes to the people of the United Kingdom, our relationship uh, with the people of the United Kingdom, uh, and this is something that the president has said himself, has grown uh, stronger and stronger. The president of France, Emmanuel Macron, said Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth embodied the continuity and unity of the British nation for over 70 years. I keep the memory of a friend of France, a queen of hearts, who marked her country and her century forever. The Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, said Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth will be remembered as a stalwart of our times. She provided inspiring leadership to her nation and people. And the President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, said it is with deep sadness that we learned of the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. On behalf of the Ukrainian people, we extend sincere condolences to the royal family, the entire United Kingdom and the Commonwealth over this irreparable loss. As her... 12th Canadian Prime Minister, I'm having trouble believing that my last sit-down with her was my last. I will so miss those chats. She was thoughtful, wise, curious, helpful, funny, and so much more. She was dubbed by one of her biographers as Queen of the World, visiting hundreds of countries throughout her reign. 
She was monarch of 15 separate realms, the head of a commonwealth of some 56 nations. So it was little surprise that news of the Queen's death made headlines around the world. The Queen has passed away. The Queen died peacefully, the royal family says, at Balmoral this afternoon. Throughout her reign, the Queen was a living embodiment of the transatlantic relationship, meeting no fewer than 12 US presidents. In a statement, President Biden described her as a stateswoman of unmatched dignity and constancy. Barack Obama said she'd reigned with grace, elegance and a tireless work ethic. She listened deeply, he said, thought strategically and was responsible for considerable diplomatic achievements. Views echoed on the streets of Washington. I admire her greatly. Yeah, I'm so sorry that she's passed. I mean, she's an icon here, everywhere. Horrible. I've been reading about her my whole life. She's one of the sane people in the UK, like the US. And that's just sad. As head of the Commonwealth, the Queen nurtured and shaped a unique international organization, binding together two and a half billion people. And it was to a meeting of Commonwealth leaders that the Queen made her last overseas tour in 2015, visiting Malta, an island she'd once called home, the bookend of a life of duty and diplomacy on the international stage. James Landell, BBC News. The uh, global significance of the passing of the Queen. Well, joining me now is the author and broadcaster Giles Branrath, a personal friend of Prince Philip and someone who's known the Queen for 50 years. Giles, it's always a pleasure to see you, but on this sad day... Just um, a sad day. Yeah, it's yeah. a significant day. The reason so many people are turning out Buckingham Palace is because people feel the loss. For most people... This is the only sovereign they have known. And it's extraordinary to think that on Tuesday of this week, this woman who was sustained by faith, but driven by duty, was again doing her duty, uh, saying goodbye to her 14th Prime Minister, welcoming her 15th Prime Minister, doing what she's been doing. And thinking of the, her new Prime Minister, I think Liz Truss was born in 1975, and her first Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, mm -hmm. the only Prime Minister she ever called Winston, she always called the others more formally. But Winston, I think, was born in something like 1876. So that gives you a, a, a feel of the span of her extraordinary life. But I think the reason that she is being mourned across the world, even by people who don't rate monarchy, don't think monarchy is important in the modern age, is because of her quality as a person. Mm. She was undoubtedly our longest reigning sovereign, probably our most popular, certainly our most respected. Uh, why? Because she had qualities that, were, that, that made her unique. Some kings and queens were remembered for the dramatic things that happened during their reign. Not so much this queen, the type of person that she was. Her dedication to service was so exemplary. Her courtesy, her kindness, her good humour, and they never wavered. She was the same person. I mean, I was lucky enough to meet her when I was still a teenager. Mm. But certainly she was the same person consistently throughout her life. What made her so special, I don't know. She would thank God. She would say that she had a, a blessed life and her faith is what kept her going. I think that's a really interesting and important point, that those personal qualities that she had, regardless of the crown on her head and the, the ermine and the, the fine jewels and so on, she was someone, you saw her in the line greeting people, you know, at some opening of some building or whatever. And there was a, there was a human relatable touch that she had. And that quality imbued, seemed to imbue everything that she did and made her so accessible to millions of people. As I say, not just here, but in the, in the Commonwealth as well. She accepted her destiny. Yeah. She said at the coronation of her parents, which she attended, getting into the carriage, she wrote an account of it for her parents, that at first the carriage was quite jolty, but gradually we got used to it. And I think that's how she found being monarch. At first a bit jolty, but she got used yeah. to it. Yeah. And she wasn't self-conscious about being the queen, she just accepted that. She was always herself. And I think the one aspect of her that maybe the public didn't see as much of as others who, were, um, who met her more uh, privately was her sense of humour. Yeah. She was a very amusing person. Uh, it's one of the things that she and Prince Philip had in common. They made each other laugh. 
and she had a great sense of humour. Uh, well, and, and we got a bit of a, a flavour of it in recent years, that wonderful sketch with James <laughs> Bond, and most recently, her brilliant acting with Paddington, Paddington. Bear. Oh. She loved... Who that's can forget thing that? Yes. She loved doing. Yes. Um, she, was, she was unique. She was extraordinary. And to be, to be valued, to be cherished, to be remembered. You think about what makes magic. What is the magic of monarchy? What is the mystery of monarchy? Why is this phenomenon that mixes fairy tale and history, why does it work? Why does it go on working? Well, during the last 70 years, it's that combination. The reason people made the series The Crown. Fairy tale mm -hmm. and drama and heritage. But the Queen gave it her own personality, a unique personality, driven by duty, sustained by faith, kept happy by her passion for her dogs and her horses. That's what she loved most in life. But her naturalness as a person, her ability to put people at ease. There's a lovely story of her at lunch one day with somebody who had been a soldier and he was suffering, he'd been in Afghanistan or someone who was suffering from post-traumatic stress and she'd been asking him about it and clearly he was, he was suffering. And she said, oh, hold on, hold on. And she leant down and she got some dog biscuits and she said, let's feed the dogs. I find that helps. <laughs> she was that sort of person. She knew how to mm. make people feel comfortable with themselves yeah. because I think she was comfortable in herself. Comfortable in her own skin as leader of the royal family and the constitutional head of this country. Um, and Sir John Major actually pointed out her humour as well mm. um, in private moments with her. And as you say, we saw some of that uh, come out in recent years. And actually, interestingly, through towards the end of, of the worst part of COVID when she had to do those Zoom meetings, you know, um, uh, accepting new ambassadors and so on and so forth. And we saw that glint in her eye and that smile on her lips from time to time. Well, I think as the years went by, she gained in confidence as yeah. a person. She was yeah. quite a shy person when she was young. Yeah. And I think she was also only 26 when she yeah. became queen. And she was following the footsteps of her father, Winston Churchill, the grand old man of British politics, was her first prime minister. Uh, at first, she was quite tentative. As a person, she was naturally conservative with a small c. Mm. But I think as the years went by, she became a little bit bolder. Uh, one of her closest friends said to me that, in a sense, that when she wouldn't have done things like the James Bond or the Panton Bear had her mother still been alive. That mm. in a way, as she became a freer person um, after her mother's death, mm. she felt she could be more herself and she mm. relaxed. And if you saw her in recent years, she was mm. a, a more relaxed person. She did have a very wry sense of humour. She never said anything unkind or unpleasant about anyone, but she could raise an eyebrow. <laughs> I remember going with her and the Prince Philip once to the Royal Variety Show, where the acts were variable. Prince Philip made his views very clear. <laughs> the Queen applauded each act in exactly the same length of time because she didn't want to make anyone feel that she hadn't liked them all equally. But she did let you know with the odd look which one she preferred. Tactful to the end. Giles, many thanks. Giles Brown with there. Uh, a personal friend of Prince Philip and someone who's known the Queen for over half a century. It's good to have you in. Thank you. The time is just after nine o'clock here in the United Kingdom. You're watching a special programme and coverage of the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history, who has died at the age of 96. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. God help me to make good my vow. Over the course of eight momentous decades, she witnessed social and economic change on a global scale. As Princess Elizabeth of York, she came to the throne at the age of just 25, following the sudden death of her father, King George VI. During her lifelong reign, the Queen dealt with no fewer than 15 Prime Ministers. The first Sir Winston Churchill, through Margaret Thatcher, of course, and Tony Blair, Boris Johnson, too. 
as head of the Commonwealth, she became the most traveled monarch in history, head of state of 15 countries at the end of her reign. The Queen's death comes just over a year after the passing of her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, her consort for more than 70 years. And over the decades, the Queen was greeted by millions of people and met her subjects on thousands of engagements in the UK and well beyond. She was last pictured here at Balmoral on Tuesday, asking Liz Truss to become Prime Minister. Now, as the crowd passes to a new king, Charles III, the Queen's death will be deeply felt by her family, of course, by people across the United Kingdom and millions around the world. Good evening. The reign of the longest serving monarch in the history of the United Kingdom has come to an end with the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Buckingham Palace made the statement just after 6.30 this evening. The Queen, who was 96, passed away at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire. Members of the royal family had made the journey there on the news that she was gravely ill. The Queen had been a commanding presence in British public life for more than eight decades and her eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has now become King Charles III. Buckingham Palace had issued this statement. Today, the Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. Well, following the death of his mother, His Majesty King Charles III released this statement. The death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. And a sign of that deep affection. On show this evening, this live pictures from Buckingham Palace where thousands of people have gathered in the pouring rain to mark their respects and to mark the passing of Her Majesty. Flowers laid outside the gates where a little after 6.30, the official announcement was posted on the railings that the Queen had died at Balmoral. Well, our Royal Correspondent Nicholas Witchell now has this account of the Queen's long life. I here present unto you Queen Elizabeth, your undoubted queen. Is your majesty willing to take the oath? She was 27 when she took the coronation oath. I solemnly promise so to do. She was anointed blessed and consecrated. She took possession of a 1,200-year-old throne. She knew that it was a role from which only death could release her. And yet, when she was born, no one had thought that it would be her destiny. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor was born on the 21st of April 1926. She was the first child of the then King's second son, the Duke of York. This was the young Princess Elizabeth at the age of four, visiting a photographic studio in London. Her life then was comparatively carefree. It was the abdication in 1936 of her uncle, King Edward VIII, that unexpectedly placed Elizabeth in direct line to the throne. Her father became king. King! King! 
His coronation gave the then 11-year-old Elizabeth a foretaste of what lay in store for her. The family unit was strong. Her father, George VI, was devoted to her and she to him. Throughout her life, he was to be her inspiration. During the Second World War, as German bombs fell on Britain, the royal family symbolised the country's fight against tyranny. Elizabeth briefly joined up. She was taught how to drive and to service an army lorry. On the night Britain celebrated victory in Europe, the crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace and Elizabeth joined her family on the palace balcony. By now she was a young woman and she'd fallen in love. Her engagement to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten was announced in July 1947. Four months later, they were married in Westminster Abbey. Again and again, the people called for Elizabeth and Philip. Again and again, they joyfully responded. A year later, their first child, Charles, was born. Two years after that, a daughter, Anne. The king had been in poor health. He'd been treated for lung cancer. When Elizabeth left for a visit to East Africa in February 1952, it was to be the last time she would see him. The flag is low as the news spreads. The king is dead. At the moment of her father's death from a heart attack, Elizabeth was in a game park in Kenya. The news that she was now queen was given to her by her husband. Her tour of the Commonwealth Castle, the princess we knew as a girl and watched in the even growth of her stature, comes back to meet her ministers as queen. In a way, I didn't have an apprenticeship. My father died much too young, and so it was all a very sudden kind of taking on and making the best job you can. Britain was stunned at the loss of its wartime king. His coffin was brought by train from Sandringham to London. Elizabeth was there to receive it with her mother and sister. And now here comes Her Majesty. Elizabeth's coronation in June 1953 was one of the biggest public celebrations in Britain's recent history. For the first time, television cameras were allowed into Westminster Abbey. The ceremony was broadcast to millions. The moment of the Queen's crowning is come. As Elizabeth was crowned, she accepted what, to her, was a sacred duty, an obligation to serve, which was to set her apart for the remainder of her life. Elizabeth was sovereign and head of state, not just of the United Kingdom, but of Britain's realms and territories in every continent. Sydney siders turn out to greet their queen. In late 1953, she set off on the first of many overseas tours, with a six-month trip to Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific. I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey through Australia. This is a joyous, fine, tingling welcome. The young queen was a star on the world stage, and her popularity was never greater. It's estimated that, in Australia, three quarters of the country's entire population turned out to see her in person. But as the 1950s gave way to the swinging 60s of the Beatles, attitudes started to change. Old certainties were questioned. The monarchy was seen by some to be stuffy and out of touch. By the late 60s, the palace realised that it needed to take the initiative. The result was a groundbreaking television documentary. The film Royal Family showed the monarchy as it had never been seen before. Elizabeth was shown performing the daily business of the sovereign. Yes, ma'am. Oh, do you think you could bring up those papers that I was looking at yesterday? And meeting visiting dignitaries. The American ambassador, Your Majesty. Oh, I fit on there. Save the trouble. But the film also showed something of the private Elizabeth, relaxing with her family on a picnic at Balmoral. The salad is ready. Good. Her silver jubilee was celebrated with street parties and pageants in 1977. Good evening, Your Majesty. 
to have had a very long, yes. long day. By the 1980s, Britain had its first woman prime minister, Margaret Thatcher. Relations between female head of state and female head of government were sometimes said to have been strained. With this ring, with this ring, I thee wed. I thee wed. For the Queen and her family, the 1980s had begun with a moment of great promise. Prince Charles's wedding in July 1981 to the young lady Diana Spencer seemed to be a moment of hope for the future. When the marriage began to fail, its decline was a very public one. The couple's separation was announced in 1992. It followed the collapse of the marriages of Princess Anne and Prince Andrew. To compound the misery that year, the Queen had seen part of her favourite home, Windsor Castle, destroyed by fire. She was devastated. The fire seemed to symbolise the reversal of the royal family's fortunes. Little wonder that in a speech the Queen described 1992 as her annus horribilis, her horrible year. But worse was to follow. The death of the by now divorced Diana, Princess of Wales, in a car crash in Paris in August 1997 was to provoke what, for the Queen, was a shocking backlash against the monarchy. She'd remained at Balmoral with Princes William and Harry after Diana died. Her priority had been to care for her grandsons. But to the grieving crowds outside Buckingham Palace and elsewhere, it seemed as though the royal family simply didn't care. The Queen returned to Buckingham Palace and, in an unprecedented live broadcast on the eve of Diana's funeral, she tried to heal the breach that had opened between the palace and the people. What I say to you now, as your queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. The queen promised to learn the lessons from Diana's life and the reaction to her death. The whole episode had shaken her. For the first time, she'd appeared to be out of tune with the feelings of her people. With Charles's marriage to his long-term companion, Camilla Parker Bowles, in April 2005, the royal family was finally able to turn the page on the domestic anguish of previous decades. It was time to move on. For the Queen, it was a moment of relief. And in the years that followed, with scarcely any lessening of her workload, she appeared to enjoy her role with renewed enthusiasm. In 2011, she was at Westminster Abbey for the wedding of her grandson, Prince William, to Catherine Middleton. It was a moment when the public's appreciation for the monarchy seemed to be reconfirmed. A few weeks later, at the age of 85, the Queen made one of the most important foreign visits of her reign when she became the first British monarch to visit the Republic of Ireland. She laid a wreath in memory of those Irish nationalists who'd risen up against the Crown and, at a state dinner in Dublin Castle, she spoke with regret about Britain's treatment of Ireland. With the benefit of historical hindsight, we can all see things which we would wish had been done differently, or not at all. The following year in Belfast, she met and shook hands with Martin McGuinness, a former leader of the IRA who by then was Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. It was another significant gesture of reconciliation. Her diamond jubilee in 2012 confirmed the nation's regard for a monarch who'd reigned for 60 years. Mr. Bond, your Majesty. It was also the year when the Queen showed that she too could spring a surprise. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Bond. Good evening, Your Majesty. Sovereign and secret agent one of the highlights of the opening night of the London Olympics. By the time of her 90th birthday in April 2016, she'd become the United Kingdom's longest reigning monarch, its oldest, and few would disagree, one of its most deeply respected. She continued with her public duties well into her 90s. There was further family turmoil, though. Prince Andrew was forced to withdraw from public life amid claims he'd sexually assaulted a 17-year-old, claims he denied. 
And then the Sussexes, Harry and Meghan, decided that they wanted to step back from royal life. They moved to California and gave a television interview in which Meghan made damaging criticisms of the royal family. They were unsettling moments, presided over by a monarch who showed that her sense of commitment was undiminished. Together we are tackling this disease. During the coronavirus emergency of 2020, she broadcast a reassuring message to the nation. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. Her words seem to encapsulate her role as monarch, drawing on her own long experience to help settle the nation at a moment of difficulty. Her resilience was evident again in April 2021, when her beloved husband Philip died two months short of his 100th birthday. They'd been married for 73 years. At Philip's funeral at St George's Chapel within Windsor Castle, she seemed a solitary figure, pausing at one point to turn and look back. The figure who'd been two paces behind her for so many years was now absent. Elizabeth had lost the husband who'd meant so much to her. But despite the great sadness of her loss, there was never any question of her withdrawing from the path of duty. She marked the 70th anniversary of her accession to the throne, a record no other monarch had achieved, in February 2022. By then it was apparent that she was rather more frail physically than before, though mentally as sharp as ever. Her doctors had advised her to take things a little easier. Light duties was the expression used by the palace, but every day there were red boxes full of official papers to deal with. In a message to mark her 70 years on the throne, she said she was humbled by the loyalty and affection she'd received throughout her reign. And she signed the statement, Your servant, Elizabeth R. By June 2022 and the public celebration of her Platinum Jubilee, her declining health limited the events she could attend. There was, however, a delightful surprise. A pre-recorded appearance, a somewhat chaotic tea party with Paddington Bear. Um, perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich. I always keep one for emergencies. So do I. I keep mine in here. Happy Jubilee, ma'am. And thank you for everything. That's very kind. This was a monarch at peace and enjoying herself. On the final day of the Jubilee celebrations, there was a final appearance on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. The national anthem was sung. A much-loved monarch acknowledged the many thousands who'd waited to greet her. The crowds cheered and cheered, but finally it was time to go. The Queen turned to depart from the balcony on which she'd first been seen as a baby. There was an unspoken feeling that an era was drawing to a close. Throughout her reign, Elizabeth II embodied the strengths of a constitutional monarch, a constant and reassuring presence at the centre of our national life. For decade after decade, she represented a changing kingdom to itself and to the world. Above all, hers was a life guided by Christian faith and driven by a profound sense of duty and by the pledge she made to the world on her 21st birthday. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it.
few moments there from a remarkable life of service and duty. And uh, many thousands of people tonight have been reflecting on those years that the Queen has reigned at Buckingham Palace with hundreds, thousands of people gathering there underneath leaden skies and pouring rain. Well, our correspondent, Mark Easton, is there for us now. And uh, Mark, the rain lashing down, but people still wanting to come out to pay their respects. Yes, because I think, Clive, that along with a sense of loss and sadness, there's also a sense of this being a very, very big moment for this country. And I think that has led to some unease and apprehension. People want to be together. They want to, 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 to be able to share in this moment and try and understand it. Because I think it is a huge moment for Britain that we have lost uh, a, a figurehead, somebody who has been the, the, the keystone in our nation's architecture and has, and has almost been the sort of solid piece of, of, of the image that people have of this country and perhaps their own sort of identity in a way. And you, you take that away and it's very difficult for people. She has, in a sense, spent her entire and very long reign trying to help the country deal with change. And here we are facing this extraordinary and enormous change, uh, difficult to, uh, to uh, overplay its importance, and we have to do it without her. So I think... Uh, that is actually quite an important reason why I think people want to come here. This, the, the, the crowd itself, I should say, is very diverse from every generation, from every background, from every ethnic country, every, every ethnic minority. Uh, they're, they're all here. And I think that that also represents the fact that the Queen was somebody who represented the whole social spectrum in Britain. Uh, and that uh, it, is, it is to... You know, it is something that she herself said, that she wanted her reign to be measured by the, the love and support that she got from the people from all, all backgrounds in, in her kingdom. And well, this, this I suppose, is, is, is powerful evidence that she achieved just that. Mark, thank you. Mark Easton there uh, at Buckingham Palace. Um, to another of the Queen's royal residences, uh, Windsor, her main residence indeed. And uh, again, more crowds, more floral tributes, more of an outpouring of sadness, grief um, for many, um, but also a sense of joy that the Queen lived for so long and for many, many people ruled so well. Uh, correspondent Adina Campbell is there for us too. Adina, um, I can see behind you some of the people who've gathered there and flowers have been left throughout the day. Windsor, um, a place of course used to the royals and in times gone by used to members of the family, senior members of the family, simply popping out to the local shops. So used were local people to their presence and uh, Windsor of course being perhaps her favourite royal residence. Indeed. Windsor was a place very dear to the Queen. This was her main home in the last few years, particularly of her life. She had spent a great deal of time here. She had spent the last 12 months, in fact, here when she started experiencing those episodic mobility problems. And people here say they have had a close relationship with the Queen. They feel that she has been their neighbour. She has been a regular face within this community and they say that she has always had that personal connection with them. There's a real sense of shock and sadness in this town tonight. People have been laying flowers, lighting candles and coming together, wiping away tears. We've seen some very emotional people here in Windsor tonight and people have travelled far and wide to be here, including Judy Chisholm from Canada, who we can speak to, Judy, you're on holiday in the UK at the moment. Yes, we are. When did you hear the news? Uh, we heard this afternoon while we were actually on a tour of Windsor Castle that the Queen's health was under medical supervision. And then we went home to our, our friend's home is in Windsor and 
put the BBC on right away because we wanted to, not to miss any news at all. We were very concerned and, and hoping that it wasn't anything more than just an episode of, of poor health that would not mean anything more than that. So we were quite shocked this evening when we did receive the news on, again, we were still on the BBC and heard from the, the news desk that we had lost the Queen. What did the Queen mean to you? Well, I'm from St. John's, Newfoundland, and in Newfoundland, the, in, the, we're, we're a very big English influence. We only joined Canada in 1949, so the Queen has always been important to us, and we've had royal visits over the years, many royal visits. I think she's represented something that is more than just her personal uh, being, but her the idea that what is possible. You know, when you think about her, her sense of duty was so unique in that was lifelong and what she did she uh, the job she undertook not just lifelong but she was such um, earnest uh, endeavor for her it, it never failed she never failed in anything that she undertook and and I think for all of us we may not be in such significant roles but we all can play a part and when you watch her and what she's done I think if everybody thought of it as a community and what they could do in their own small way we could certainly form stronger bonds with our neighbours and, and our communities. I just think she, she represented so much. Judy, thank you very much. Well, when the announcement was made a short time ago, there was a poignant moment here in Windsor. A rainbow appeared in the sky moments after we got the news that the Queen had died. And people really took a moment to, to soak up what had happened. They were still, they were silent. And it was a special moment, moments after the flag had been lowered, not quite to half-mast, but it had been lowered. And Windsor tonight is in mourning. People here say there is a deep loss and there will be that mourning for, for many days, many weeks to come. Adina, thank you. Uh, Adina Campbell there at uh, Windsor Castle. That rainbow appearing above Buckingham Palace as well, um, just before the announcement that the Queen had died a few hundred miles north at Balmoral too. In June, the nation celebrated Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee, marking 70 years on the throne. It is a landmark that no other British monarch has ever reached. Sarah Campbell looks back at her life. The sun shone and crowds filled the mall. For four days in June, the message could not have been clearer. God save the Queen! Concrete jungle where trees are made A galaxy of rock royalty and the British people in their thousands celebrating a reign etched so deeply in our memories. Your Majesty, Mummy. You have been there for us for these 70 years. These pictures on your house are the story of your life and ours. And listen to the reaction of this delighted and grateful crowd. The Queen's appearances were brief but unforgettable. Oh, that's wonderful. On the first day, her delight, both at the sight and sound of so many people and the antics of her great-grandson, were obvious. That evening, Her Majesty lit the first of a giant chain of beacons, symbols of hope in two and a half thousand towns and cities from Shetland to Australia and New Zealand. What a wonderful sound, those bells. It can be heard all over the city of London. The next morning, the bells of St Paul's marked the national service of Thanksgiving. The surrounding pavements packed with well-wishers. We'll never see this again in our lifetime, so it's, it's really a special day for us, yeah. Absolutely magical atmosphere. We're enjoying every second. This was the largest gathering of royals since before the pandemic. Almost all the members of her family were there, but not the Queen. She was unable to attend in person, but watched the service from home. Thank you for showing us how service and faithfulness matter. This is English champagne, especially for the Queen. 
The thank yous continued at tens of thousands of Jubilee lunches, bringing communities together, something the Queen had done throughout her reign. We talk about it, love, love, love. We talk about it, love. At the Platinum Party at the Palace, a lineup of legends. Each with their own memory of Britain's longest reign. And I've grown up with this woman. You know, I was seven when, when she came to the throne. So she's always been part of my life. Around the Olympics, yeah. she was absolutely essential. When some of the selection panel come through the city, she hosted them at Buckingham Palace on a Friday night and even appeared on the balcony and waved them goodbye. So it, it sort of put Paris and Madrid in its place. Yes. <laughs> I do hope you're having a lovely jubilee. To those memories, she added... Tea? Two more. Oh, yes, please. Stealing the show with Paddington. A wave from Her Majesty to acknowledge the wave of love that is surely coming across that balcony and sweeping its way through the palace. And bringing events to a close on the balcony of Buckingham Palace, surrounded by her family, including her three heirs. A wonderful four day party was officially over. But what a platinum jubilee it had been. Sarah Campbell reporting there. Joining me now is Camilla Tomini, um, Associate Editor at the Daily Telegraph, Royal Correspondent, Journalist and Broadcaster. Camilla, thanks for coming in. Um, we saw there what those four days meant to many people in this country, the celebration of such a long and dutiful reign. This year, of course, now marks her passing. But both events were a cause for reflection on a remarkable woman and a remarkable period in British history. And how wonderful as well that the Platinum Jubilee weekend was such a success and an opportunity for the public to celebrate the Queen in life. And I think we know afterwards that she bookended that event because she knew that her presence needed to be seen. Mm. Her mantra throughout life is, I need to be seen to be believed. Yeah. And even though she had those health problems that precluded her from taking part throughout the whole weekend, that was a way for the nation, the Commonwealth and the world to say thank you to her in life. So we remember her in death, but I just feel grateful and I'm sure people watching this will feel grateful that we had that moment to celebrate and that it was such a triumph. She clearly took delight and we spoke to people in the palace afterwards to see those crowds out in the mall opposite Buckingham Palace. I mean, even after 70 years, she never mm -hmm. grew used to that sight. And I think also, thoroughly enjoyed the presence of her children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren being part of the event and also being embraced by the British public and beyond. I think she loved the idea that it was very much a royal family affair that weekend. Mm. And the crowds out in front of Buckingham Palace for that moment and for those celebrations and they are there again tonight, despite the rain, despite the inclement weather. And I suppose... <sighs> Our thoughts at some point quite soon are now going to turn to the future mm. and to King Charles III and that sense that I would have thought the majority of this country would want, and indeed the Commonwealth, that sense of continuity and that sense of service and duty to continue. Well, as the longest serving heir apparent in history, we can agree, can't we, that uh, King Charles, as he's now known, has learned from the master or the mistress in the queen, his mother. Um, but of course, there's a destabilizing and disconcerting effect to losing somebody who's been such a stalwart part of British life. I mean, the queen has represented for many, many years what it is to be British and has always been a reassuring presence, not just as head of state, but frankly, as mother and grandmother of the nation. And if you think about the effect she had on the nation, at a time of great difficulty only recently during coronavirus. I mean, who else could have come out with the we'll meet again speech but a woman of her wisdom and experience, somebody who had experienced the Second World War firsthand. So 
to lose that presence, to lose somebody who is absolutely fundamentally woven into the fabric of British life is going to be difficult. And it's going to be even more difficult because people are already face it, facing pressures. And we are going through hard times right now. Uh, you said she represents what it means to be British. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean in the sense of public service and a life devoted to others, mm. um, in a sense of trying to represent us um, with a soft power punch across the world as the world's most travelled diplomat, um, but as somebody who has always wanted to be with her people, you know, at the centre of the royal walkabout, extending a white gloved hand to those who want to meet her. The most interesting thing about her reign is how many people got to see the Queen in the flesh. Many, many, many hundreds of thousands and millions of people got to do that because she made herself that presence. So, again, to go full circle and think about the Platinum Jubilee, if young children out there got to catch a glimpse of the Queen that weekend, then that's a wonderful thing and a thing that we should reflect on now in times of sorrow that we had that lovely moment in June to really recognise her contribution and celebrate it. Yeah, my own mother, a teacher in Jamaica, uh, that first Caribbean tour after she was crowned queen, um, led out a school party of girls and boys and, um, yeah, saw the queen and the Duke of Edinburgh on that, uh, well, it was Land Rover, I think it was, yes. as it moved through the crowds. And uh, my mother remembers that to this day. And we'll still talk about it. And still talks about it. And that's it. why the Queen always used to wear bright colours, because she wanted people to point her out in a crowd. Yeah. Because they knew that even though she was doing these jobs day to day, for that one person seeing yeah. her for the first time, and yeah. probably only time in their lives, yeah. they would remember it and tell their children and grandchildren forever yeah. about that moment. It's funny, I was talking to her recently about that, and she said she just looks so small and frail. But she, it's interesting when I met her. She had the heart of a king. Well, and, a queen. And, and also, you know, you get this impression of her from stamps and money that she's quite a serious and austere figure. And yeah. then when I met her at Buckingham Palace, she was so smiley and sparkly. Mm. Um, I mean, even that last image that was taken at Balmoral um, after the prime ministerial handover of her just standing in front of the fire. I mean, what an adorable image of a smiling queen still doing her duty to the very end. I mean, it's remarkable, really, if you think mm. about a 96-year-old working that far beyond retirement age and carrying out a constitutional duty like that two days before she passes away. Indeed. Amazing. Camilla, it's good to talk to you. Camilla Tomini there from The Daily Telegraph. Well, the Queen spent the majority of her later years at her official residence of Windsor Castle in Berkshire, including throughout the height of the coronavirus pandemic. Our correspondent, Fergal Keane, has been gathering reaction from the people there. The signal of an ending in the place so close to her heart and in whose heart she was beloved. We've just heard the news. What are you feeling? Wow, it's just hit me. It really has, and I think it's going to hit everybody in this town, but not only here, all over the world. You know, she was a grandmother, she was a mum. She's part of my life, she's part of my mum's life, my late father's life, every, everybody. As the news filtered out across the town, there was comfort in gathering together to absorb, to reflect. It's very sad. I think everyone's just come to pay their respects because she's such an amazing woman. Um, it's just very sombre mood in Windsor, really. And what did she represent to people of your generation? A guiding light, a moral code, how to conduct yourself, how to act, you know, what's right and what's wrong. Here on the streets of Royal Windsor, the sense of an epoch having passed is palpable. There is the sense of mourning shared with the entire nation. But something else. For these people have lost a neighbour, a queen who was part of their daily lives. Amir Bukhari was getting calls from relatives in Pakistan who'd heard the news. He runs a cafe beside Windsor Castle. Uh, no words actually to express my emotions. It's really sad. What did she mean to you? Uh, she was really, really important. It's not only me, it's around the world. Everybody was feel very sad, very down, very depressed. Yes, and for her, for her, for us, she was a neighbor, and we feel more. No matter how long anticipated, the end has crystallized loss. The passing of a monarch 
who symbolized to people the best of their nation, of themselves. Fergal Keane, BBC News, Windsor. Uh, Liz Truss, uh, Prime Minister, uh, she of course was asked to become leader of the Conservative Party and of course Prime Minister um, earlier this week and uh, she has been leading tributes to the Queen today. We are all devastated by the news that we have just heard from Balmoral. The death of Her Majesty the Queen is a huge shock to the nation and to the world. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. She ascended the throne just after the Second World War. She championed the development of the Commonwealth from a small group of seven countries to a family of 56 nations spanning every continent of the world. We are now a modern, thriving, dynamic nation. Through thick and thin, Queen Elizabeth II provided us with the stability and the strength that we needed. She was the very spirit of Great Britain, and that spirit will endure. Well, our political editor, Chris Mason, is at Downing Street for us now. Chris, um, the last 15 prime ministers this country has had have only known the Queen as the person that they see pretty much every week for that uh, audience with her. Um, how do you think the situation may change, if at all, now that it is Charles III, King Charles III, whom um, political leaders will be now addressing? I think the striking thing, Clive, is that for the current Prime Minister, who only had that one audience with the Queen 48 hours ago, her first audience and her final audience, she will adjust as she is adjusting to high office herself just 48 hours in as Prime Minister to audiences that will come in the weeks, months and years ahead uh, with the King. And, you know, that will be an opportunity, as it has been for her predecessors, to have in the sanctity and the privacy of a palace a conversation between monarch and prime minister about affairs of state, but she won't be able to tap in, the prime minister, to the longevity of experience that so many of her predecessors were able to in those conversations with the Queen. David Cameron, the former prime minister, uh, reflecting uh, in the last couple of hours that he was able to enjoy the wisdom of the world's most experienced diplomat, such as the longevity of her service, the longevity of her time on the global stage. Chris, thank you, our political editor there at uh, Downing Street. Throughout her life, the Queen was guided by her strong Christian beliefs and was the formal head, of course, of the Church of England, a role she combined with a desire to acknowledge the contribution made by other faiths. Our religion editor, Ali Mukbul, is outside Lambeth Palace, the London home of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And what have we been hearing from Lambeth Palace, Ali? Yes, uh, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, has led uh, the tributes, talking of his uh, profound sadness at the news, uh, of course, but also, as we've been hearing from others, talking of the great privilege he had of meeting the Queen on many occasions, talking, as others have, about her clarity of thinking, her capacity to listen carefully, and also her uh, humility, her humour, her kindness, and called her uh, a blessing uh, to all of us. Pope Francis uh, has also sent a telegraph to the King uh, offering what he called his heartfelt condolences to the King, to the Royal Family, but also to uh, all of us here in the UK and in the Commonwealth and paid tribute to the Queen's, uh, in his words, unstinting service. We've heard uh, from others too. Cardinal Vincent Nichols, who's head of the uh, Catholic Church here in England and Wales, said the Queen would remain a shining light in our history and also talked about the way in which she had inspired him personally uh, through her wisdom, uh, through her stability. But of course, uh, as you rightly said in your introduction, uh, particularly in the later part of her reign, the Queen talked a lot uh, about how she felt Anglicanism had a duty to protect the practice of other faiths. That's certainly uh, reflected by the Chief Rabbi, Ephraim uh, Mervis, 
uh, who said that the Queen embodied everything uh, that was noble in British society. Zara Muhammad uh, of the Muslim Council of Britain said uh, that people of all faiths and none were joining together in paying tribute to the Queen. And I should just say in the last uh, hour or so, the Church of England has encouraged churches right across the country tomorrow at midday to toll their bells for an hour and open their doors for special prayers in remembrance of the Queen. Okay, that will be quite a moment. Ali McBool, live at Lambeth Palace, of course, the home of the Archbishop of Canterbury. For much of her reign, the Queen carried out dozens, often hundreds, of official visits each year around the UK. Three decades ago, she went to Leeds, and, as Danish Savage now reports, everyone who met her remembered the experience for their lives. The year is 1990. The city is Leeds. The location is not a stately home or big business. It's the inner city neighbourhood of Chapel Town, home to a large Caribbean community. After lunch of avocado mousse and poached salmon, prepared in the Caribbean style, the silver service. More than 30 years on, those who were there still remember it well. She asked them, you know, what they did here and so on, and which islands they were from. And they told her, and they also said how happy they were when she visited the West Indies. <laughs> That's Francine's sister and Heather's mum, who organised the visit, but died a few months afterwards. She was the one who invited the Queen to Chapel Town. She was terminally ill at the time, um, and, but she set that, her mind to it. That, that was one of the goals she wanted to achieve um, within the short time frame, and um, it was achievable. Uh, she got a letter back. We still have copies of the letters, and it was gr great to have the whole community involved in that. All the people from the, um, the West Indies um, do, held the Queen in high regard. They were, she was their Queen and to actually be able to, to, to see her and meet her meant a lot to them. She was their queen, and to actually see her in the flesh, I think that was the most important, the, and to come to Chapel Town. It's a new home for the Northern Dance Company. Sharon Watson choreographed the dance lesson that day. Oh. Now, she's the chief executive of the Northern School of Contemporary Dance, based in Chapel Town. I think the community showed an interest. I think there was a real curiosity around that visit. Um, and historically, it just meant that somebody actually has taken the time to notice us. And that's, that's important. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenges nationally, internationally, and for us to feel that Hairholes in Chapel Town was a focus for the Queen was amazing. Of course, those that came from the Caribbean understood who she was and why there was that connection to the Queen and the Commonwealth. Um, and there is a loyalty there. There's a real sense that she is the leader. She is the one that's guiding the country, guiding the countries. So that respect has always been there. And even with my parents, I think there is a real sense that the Queen has paved the way for many. So you show her that respect. It might have been for just a day, but the memories and the effect of the Queen's visit to this corner of Leeds has lasted a generation. Joining me again is our royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell. Nick, um, just sum up, if you can, and I know you've been talking a lot throughout the day on all of this, but just sum up your reflections on what is a seismic moment in it is. British it's, history. It's absolutely massive, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I forget which politician or which prime minister or former prime minister it was who said, mm. it is hard to imagine... Britain without her. And I think that is nothing less than the truth. As uh, Liz Truss, her most recent Prime Minister, said, she was the rock upon which modern Britain was built. Um, it is hard, really, fully to take it in that this reign has ended. And I think people are going to need time to process this. I think it's going to be quite unsettling and disorientating for a number of people. I think we've already seen that people feel the need to meet take comfort from each other. I suspect that in terms of the scale of what we're about to witness, this is going to be, I suspect, comparable to the reaction to Diana's death. Quite different in character because that was such a, a shock, mm -hmm. unexpected shock, and there were all sorts of emotions at work there. This is purely thanks and tribute and mourning, pure mourning, but I think people Everybody, or so many people, will feel the need to express 
their um, tributes in their own way and probably with the laying of flowers and signing of books. Mm -hmm. um, it is hard to distill the 70 years and what she has meant, but she has really been this source of reassurance. She has been constant and steadfast, this reassuring figure in such changing times, a distillation of our national identity, a symbol of unity. She has uh, been shrewd in the way that she has handled her prime minister's keen interest in politics whilst remaining steadfastly and completely above it. But a shrewd woman who enjoyed being queen. That, I think, is something that um, isn't generally appreciated. She enjoyed the role. We've had the seamless transition of Prince Charles to Charles III. Um, that continuity is there. What should we be expecting now over the next two or three days? Well, there will be a meeting of what's called the Accession Council, which is a number of members of the Privy Council. It used to be every Privy Councillor. It used to be the time when every Privy Councillor was called to a meeting. Uh, I gather that on this occasion it will be limited uh, to a certain number because there simply isn't room for all of them. But that will be a sort of then a reading of proclamations and I would imagine that the King will address the Accession Council. There will be any number of arrangements uh, culminating, of course, in a state funeral, um, the first state funeral that we will have seen since the state funeral of Winston Churchill in 1965. Uh, that probably, I mean, this we will, um, these arrangements will unfold in coming days, but we're probably talking about uh, 10 or so days from now. Mm -hmm. And in the intervening days, there will be so many tributes. So many people will just feel that they want to mark the passing of um, somebody who I think uh, we will judge, and history will judge, to have been one of the most remarkable monarchs in the 1,000, 1,200-year history of the British monarchy. Mm. And briefly, Nick, her legacy globally, not just to this country. Her legacy has been to keep Britain's reputation strong internationally. If you think of the times when Britain's reputation has been low, think of Suez in the 50s or when Britain was the sick man of Europe in the 70s, one of the outstanding things about Britain that was always respected was the reputation of the Queen. Yeah. That was a reputation which earned respect throughout the 70 years of her reign. She has, I think, kept the monarchy strong at home. There have been ups and downs, bumps, of course, there have over the 70 years, uh, bumps generally caused by other members of her family, as we've seen recently. But she, throughout it all, has embodied, I think, the best of qualities, duty and decency and tolerance. And she has, I think, uh, brought out the best in politicians. She's had, or sort of had an aura, a force field almost around her, and that has encouraged politicians and others to behave in the best way that they could. And I think that is part of her legacy. Indeed. Nick, many thanks for that. Nicholas Witchell, our royal correspondent. Well, in a moment, there will be continuing coverage with my colleague Hugh Edwards, but I'm going to leave you now with uh, some images through the reign of Queen Elizabeth II, who's died today at Balmoral at the age of 96. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. God help me to make good my vow. And God bless all of you who are willing to share in it.
the longest reigning monarch in British history. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has died at the age of 96. Oh. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. God help me to make good my vow. Over the long course of nine momentous decades, she witnessed social and economic change on a global scale. As Princess Elizabeth of York, she'd come to the throne at the age of 25, following the sudden death of her father, King George VI. During her lifelong reign, the Queen dealt with no fewer than 15 Prime Ministers, including Sir Winston Churchill, Margaret Thatcher, Tony Blair and Boris Johnson. As head of the Commonwealth, she became the most travelled monarch in history, as head of state of 15 countries. And Queen's death comes just over a year after the loss of her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, her consort for over 70 years. Over the decades, the Queen was greeted by millions of people worldwide and met her subjects on thousands of engagements in the UK and overseas. And the Queen was last seen by the public in this image, taken at Balmoral on Tuesday, inviting Liz Truss to become the new Prime Minister. As the Crown passes to King Charles III, the Queen's death will be deeply felt by her family, by the people of the UK and by millions in the Commonwealth and beyond. Earlier this evening, Buckingham Palace announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in the history of the United Kingdom, and the commanding presence in British public life over a span of eight decades. She died at Balmoral in Aberdeenshire at the age of 96. The Queen's eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has become King Charles III. It was at half past six this evening that Buckingham Palace released this formal statement. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. Our Royal Correspondent uh, Nicholas Witchell is with me and will be with me throughout this extended edition of BBC News at 10. And uh, Nick, let's just reflect first on the fact that this news, which came several hours ago, is already, and we feel it, calling rip ripples of dismay and shock and grief, not just in the UK, but around the world. Wave upon wave of grief. I think it was Boris Johnson who coined that phrase. It is a moment of profound importance and profound sadness. Uh, a moment so many people had hoped somehow would never happen, but of course now it has. Yet it is hard still to take in the sad reality that this reign has ended. I think it is going to take time for the nation to process this. There will be, and there is, a tremendous sense of loss. Many, I think, will find this quite unsettling and disorientating. And we're seeing people are needing to come together there outside Buckingham Palace on this mm. bleak, rainy night in the early autumn. I think people feel the need to be together at this particular moment, seeking comfort from each other, because amid all the other uncertainties that we face as a nation. Now our head of state has died. This person who has been in the background to our lives, as we've been saying this afternoon, uh, for most of us throughout all of our lives. There aren't many people who have known anything other than a nation with the Queen as its uh, head of state. She was indeed, as Prime Minister Liz Truss said, the rock on which modern Britain was built a source of reassurance mm. and stability for so many decades. We saw that during the COVID pandemic. We've seen it so many mm. times. There was something timeless 
about her. It was Boris Johnson who also said that. And that really is monarchy. There is mm. something timeless about monarchy, an institution that is above politics, that captures the imagination and the affection in a way that no politician can possibly do, representing something beyond itself. And that's what she did for these seven decades, representing the best of qualities of decency and humility and duty, constant in the ever-changing world that we live in. Pretty much every aspect mm. of our lives has changed since 1952 when she came to the throne, mm. except her mm. until now. I think history will say that this was one of the most remarkable reigns in the thousand year history mm. of the monarchy in these islands, a reign that will be talked about, a queen who will be talked about in the centuries that come. But now the crown has passed. We have a king. We'll discuss lots of those aspects, uh, Nick, in the next uh, 90 minutes or so. Um, the impact of the reign and, of course, the nature of transition as well and what that means, uh, not just to the royal family, but to the entire country. But for now, Nicholas Witchell, thank you. Uh, the death happened at Balmoral, the uh, Queen's cherished estate in Aberdeenshire, uh, where she decided in July that she wanted to spend the summer, as she always did, despite the health problems and despite the mobility problems, but that is where she passed away earlier today. Our Scotland editor, James Cook, is at Balmoral tonight. Um, and I'm imagining, James, that the, the solemn sense there will echo what happens here in Buckingham Palace, as we saw just a, a while ago. Yes, that's right, Hugh. I mean, the sun set on the Balmoral estate on Royal Deeside just over a couple of hours ago, shrouded in thick cloud, also setting on an era, on the Elizabethan era. But before we even examine that period, here tonight, there is a family in mourning, the king leading those mourners, his family, who have all gathered here, all the senior members of the royal family, gathered here this evening to pay their respects to a woman who was a grandmother and a mother, as well as, of course, the monarch. It is, one might say, perhaps appropriate that the Queen died here in the place that some say she loved more than anywhere else, the Royal Deeside Balmoral Estate, where things continue. The rain has teemed down all day. The River Dee continues to rush under Isambard Kingdom Brunel's bridge, just a short distance from here. And there is continuity, too, in the shift from the Queen to the King, to King Charles. James, many thanks for now. James Cook, our Scotland editor at Balmoral, where of course we saw some of the other members of the royal family gathering earlier today. Shortly after the Queen's death was announced, the new King, King Charles III, released this statement. The death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. And Charles goes on to say, I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and the deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held the words of the new king, King Charles III, uh, a short while ago. Well, tonight in this extended edition of BBC News at 10, we will be paying tribute to Her Majesty, of course, to all that uh, she achieved in a momentous and eventful reign. We'll be considering the impact of her death on British public life. Uh, the Queen had symbolised, as Nick was saying, all that was constant uh, and all that was reassuring. And for the vast majority of people in Britain and the Commonwealth, uh, a treasured and highly visible link with Britain's past has now gone. Our royal correspondent, Daniela Ralph, reports now on the events of the day so far. Tuesday, the 6th of September. The last photographs of the Queen. 96 years old and still at work. Meeting the new Prime Minister at Balmoral, a duty she had been keen to fulfil. 
and one we now know was her final duty after seven decades of public service. Around four o'clock this afternoon, a number of the Queen's family arrived at Aberdeen Airport. Her grandson, the Duke of Cambridge, was first to emerge, followed by her daughter-in-law, Sophie, the Countess of Wessex. And then her two youngest sons, Edward, the Earl of Wessex, and Andrew, the Duke of York. The Duke of Cambridge drove the family group to Balmoral to join his father and other members of the family already there with the Queen. Harry, the Duke of Sussex, arrived separately later in the evening. Here in the UK for a number of charity events, his wife Meghan did not accompany him to Scotland. At 6.30, Buckingham Palace officially announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Following tradition, the statement was attached to the palace gates by two footmen as tributes began. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. She was the very spirit of Great Britain and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. And also from the leader of the opposition. For the vast majority of us, the late Queen has been simply the Queen, the only Queen. Above all else, our Queen. As we mourn her loss, we should also treasure her life, our longest serving and greatest ever monarch. Above the clashes of politics, she stood not for what the nation fought over, but what it agreed upon. Throughout the day, there had been growing unease about the Queen's health. In the Commons, as Keir Starmer stood up to speak, Opposite him, the Prime Minister was being told of the Queen's condition. Information passed to Angela Rayner, Labour's deputy leader, who left her seat for a while to discuss the development, before the Speaker of the House addressed the chamber. I know I speak on behalf of the entire House when I say that we send our best wishes to Her Majesty the Queen and that she and the Royal Family are in our thoughts and prayers at this moment. Cheered by onlookers, one of the Queen's last royal engagements was in July, with her daughter, Princess Anne, opening a new state-of-the-art hospice in Berkshire. But these kind of visits had become rare over the past year. As the Queen relied on her walking stick, her mobility compromised. The royal household had tried to adapt to keep her active and visible. A golf buggy at the Chelsea Flower Show helped keep the Queen comfortable. But she had become noticeably thinner and frailer, something that severely limited her involvement in her own Platinum Jubilee celebrations, with her family increasingly representing her. At the weekend, her son stood in at the Braemar Highland Games, always a favourite event for the Queen that she reluctantly missed. Like so much of her life, the decline in her health was played out in public, Duty may have got harder to manage physically, but mentally, even emotionally, the Queen remained engaged and working to the very end. Some uh, of the lovely images there, including the image of the Queen uh, inviting Liz Truss uh, to form a government, and that was, of course, just uh, a couple of days ago. Queen looking frail, but uh, smiling and clearly very focused on the important constitutional duty there of talking to the new Prime Minister. We saw crowds starting to gather outside Buckingham Palace as soon as the news emerged that there were concerns about the Queen's health. And then, of course, there was the formal um, demonstration of the news from Buckingham Palace when they posted that uh, notice on the railings there. And the crowds are still there tonight. And our, Mark, uh, our home editor, Mark Easton, is at the palace uh, and uh, obviously Mark you've seen the crowds milling around there throughout the evening the question for you I really wanted to put was this given your perspective on 
British public life and the Queen's role in that. Um, what, what has changed today in the way that the people of the United Kingdom possibly see themselves and the way that they have a reference point in the monarchy which has changed today? Well, I think that's a very good question, Hugh. Uh, the Queen had become something of a keystone in the nation's architecture, a solid and a movable piece that defined the nation's image to itself. And now that piece is no longer there. And I think this is, you know, a, a, a huge moment for Britain. And I think, you know, many of the people who are coming here tonight, despite you know, torrential rain on and off, uh, still thousands here at Buckingham Palace, uh, are doing so because they need to come together. They need to deal with the reality of the Queen no longer being there. The Queen herself spoke of her, the part of her job being to ease the process of change, that, uh, that symbol of continuity. Um, but of course, this is going to be a massive change and she won't be there. And that, I think, is what makes this such a difficult moment for Britain, that people will, will, will want to search for things that, that, that show the stability and strength of the UK right now, and perhaps that one figurehead is not there. So the people who've come here this evening, despite this bad weather, are doing so because, yes, they want to to mourn their queen, to share in their loss, but I think also that they want to mark an extraordinary life, a queen who was their Elizabeth the Great. Indeed, Mark, many thanks again for the thoughts there at Buckingham Palace. Mark Easton, our home editor. Uh, Buckingham Palace, of course, very much regarded by the queen as the office, if you like, the, the office of the firm uh, of the royal family. Um, Somewhere like Balmoral was seen as a favourite summer escape. Um, Sandringham, again, in the east of England, had a very special quality. Um, but, of course, Windsor really was the base. That's where the Queen spent so much time. That, that was home in so many ways. Um, and spent a lot of time there, certainly in recent years as well, because of the Covid pandemic and the lockdown, and spent quite a bit of time at Windsor with her late husband, uh, Prince Philip, too. So Windsor and the royal family very tightly uh, interlinked. And our special correspondent, Fergal Keane, has been uh, gathering reaction from people in the uh, royal town of Windsor. The signal of an ending in the place so close to her heart <laughs> and in whose heart she was beloved. We've just heard the news. What are you feeling? Wow, it's just hit me. It really has, and I think it's going to hit everybody in this town, but not only here, all over the world. You know, she was a grandmother, she was a mum. She's part of my life, she's part of my mum's life, my late father's life, every, everybody. As the news filtered out across the town, there was comfort in gathering together to absorb, to reflect. It's very sad. I think everyone's just come to pay their respects because she's such an amazing woman. Um, it's just very sombre mood in Windsor, really. And what did she represent to people of your generation? A guiding light, a moral code, how to conduct yourself, how to act, you know, what's right and what's wrong. And she was such a special lady. Like, she was so lovely and so cute and so warm. And um, I think she just won everyone's heart. Like, even with my daughter, she said, I really want her to live to 100. She's been saying that to me for the last few years. And she's just part of our life, really. She was a part of our life, especially living local as well. The sense of royal continuity is not broken by death. But the Queen's example of resilience in the face of adversity will be missed. She's had terrible moments throughout her reign of, of things that have happened uh, that she's had to deal with. Um, and she's just done a, a really... I think she's done just a good job. And... Uh, and she said it would be for her life, for the length of her life, and that's what it's been. Here on the streets of Royal Windsor, the sense of an epoch having passed is palpable. There is the sense of mourning shared with the entire nation. But something else. For these people have lost a neighbour, a queen who was part of their daily lives. 
Amir Bukhari was getting calls from relatives in Pakistan who'd heard the news. He runs a cafe beside Windsor Castle. I have no words actually to express my emotions. It's really sad. What did she mean to you? Uh, she was really, really important. It's not only me, it's around the world. Everybody was feel very sad, very down, very depressed. Yes, and for her, for her, for us, she was a neighbor, and we feel more. No matter how long anticipated, the end has crystallized loss. The passing of a monarch who symbolized to people the best of their nation, of themselves. Long after sunset, they were still arriving. Their queen gone, their mourning just begun. Fergal Keane, BBC News, Windsor. Some lovely contributions there from people in and around Windsor today and uh, Fergal there having a chat with lots of them, including people who rather touchingly called themselves uh, neighbours, people in their shops and businesses, of course, around Windsor Castle. So that was during the day and the early part of this evening. Let's go to Windsor tonight. And uh, my colleague, uh, Adina Campbell, is there. Adina, how would you describe the atmosphere in Windsor this evening? Well, there's a deep sense of loss here in Windsor tonight. People have been gathering to pay their respects. They've been laying flowers. Those flowers have now been moved to the Long Walk. They've also been lighting candles and sharing stories, reflecting on some of their fondest memories of the Queen. And people have travelled far and wide to be here, but of course this is close to local residents. And we can speak to one local family who got here at about half past nine this evening. Mariam, Gordon, Maz, you're from Slough, just 15 minutes down the road. Mariam, you were a big fan of the Queen. Yeah, I was, and I was very sad to hear the news when I found out that the Queen had passed away. And you were here back in May during the Platinum Jubilee celebration. Yes, yes, I was. I was here during the Platinum Jubilee. And how was that? It was really fun, but it was also it was amazing to see and watch, and all the people crowding. Gordon Maz, you've both met the Queen in the past. You've been in close proximity. What was that like? Um, <laughs> some years ago in my case, and having seen service in my lifetime, I'm proud to be here this evening, although I'd rather not be. Um, it, it, just an amazing lady, you know, 70 years. And we've just celebrated a jubilee. Um, an incredible week for this nation, and one that will go down in history with a change of Prime Minister and obviously uh, now with our Sovereign. So... Um, just very proud indeed to have had the honour of serving. Maz, why did you feel the need to be here in Windsor tonight? Uh, I think the Queen is, she's like everyone's grandmother really, um, the constant that's always been there. Um, I think everyone's going to be feeling like they've lost a member of their family really. Um, she's done some incredible work for this country and we'll forever be grateful for her. There's nobody like her in the world. I'm very sad. And what does it mean being outside her main home? Yeah, I mean, we were only here a few days ago having a co nice little coffee on summer's day and I just said to my husband earlier that uh, last time we were here, Queen was with us, she was alive, and today we're here um, mourning her, her loss, really. So, yeah, it's, it's a really sad day, really sad day. Do you think you'll be coming back here? over yes, the coming days? Uh, we, we enjoy Windsor anyway as a town, um, but this is the castle, Her Majesty and the family are very much a part of it. And there's a connection there with the people, I think. And uh, very often, uh, in recent times particularly, we have seen the Royal Standard here on a frequent basis because Windsor was so much her, her home. Uh, obviously, she's away in Balmoral at the time of her passing. But, uh, um, you know, I think uh, we have a natural affinity with Windsor and. Um, and that will continue. Gordon, Maz, Mariam, thank you very much. Well, when we heard the news a short time ago, Windsor was still, it was silent, and there was a very poignant moment. A rainbow appeared, and that brought a smile to some sad faces. Adina, many thanks, Adina Campbell, and thanks to your guests as well there in Windsor. One of the first uh, tributes paid earlier this evening, as soon as the news was announced of the Queen's death, 
was in Downing Street, where the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, um, came and presented her tribute to the Queen with some thoughts on the Queen's remarkable contribution over so many years on the throne. And, of course, reflecting on the fact that um, she had been uh, installed as Prime Minister just a couple of days ago, thanks to that audience that she'd been granted with the Queen uh, in Balmoral. And as the guest there was telling Adina in Windsor, uh, it is turning out to be a momentous week um, in which the Prime Minister has changed. And now we're in a position where uh, King Charles III is on the throne. Uh, it is no longer Queen Elizabeth uh, the second. Let's go to Downing Street and our political editor Chris Mason is there. Um, Chris, lots of tributes today, including from Boris Johnson and uh, Keir Starmer. And uh, of course, the first was the new Prime Minister Liz Truss. And um, what a, well, what a burden in some senses for a new Prime Minister uh, to be in a position where an event of this magnitude has happened within days of taking office. A huge burden, Hugh, just 48 hours into office as Prime Minister, just 48 hours on from her own trip to Balmoral for her first and, it turns out, only audience with the Queen as Prime Minister. Within 48 hours, returning here to Downing Street herself, adjusting to high office as the head of government, having to find those words to try and sum up on behalf of the, the UK uh, the loss uh, of uh, the Queen. We've learnt in the hours since that statement that, that Liz Truss had been informed by the Cabinet Secretary Simon Case at around about 4.30 this afternoon of the uh, Queen's passing and then shortly after she gave her statement here in Downing Street uh, at around 7 o'clock uh, this evening she did have a telephone conversation uh, with the King. This evening uh, the Prime Minister has been chairing meetings involving senior secretaries of state and uh, staff from the royal household to discuss uh, events in the forthcoming days and both tomorrow and on saturday there'll be tributes to the queen paid by mps uh, in the house of commons and of course for the next little period of time the next 10 days or so politics will fall silent that the noise and the turbulence so often associated with this postcode will fall silent. And I think there's a bigger question worth reflecting on as well tonight, Hugh, which is how the passing of the Queen shapes our national conversation from here on. Because of her longevity, because of that constance in a world of change, and because of that dignity and privacy and discretion around her own personal views in contrast with the raging noise of politics at Westminster, where does it leave us as a country in terms of how we see ourselves and how the world sees us because for so many the Queen personified the UK and now she's gone and that could have significant consequences I think for the, the national conversation and with it our national politics in the months and years to come. Uh, indeed Chris something that uh, I'm sure will be discussed again in the days ahead but many thanks for the moment Chris Mason our political editor um, there and uh, Nicholas Witchell, our royal correspondent, is still with me. Um, and really, just to reflect on that very salient point that Chris was making there, which is that this change of monarch from Elizabeth II to Charles III um, is really about changing, in some senses, the way that people will see the monarchy, because they saw the monarchy in a certain way uh, with Elizabeth II and saw it in that way for many, many years. That changes. And that brings with it maybe changes in perception where the monarchy is concerned. And I think she has left a huge legacy in, in several areas. I think she demonstrated the sometimes almost intangible strength and value of a constitutional monarchy. I mean, monarchy done right is a powerful focus for national feeling and national unity. And to pick up the point that Chris was making there, she did indeed project the image unfailingly positively abroad. It is sometimes referred to as soft power and she projected it par excellence. If you think of the times over the past uh, 70 years when the reputation of Britain has been at a low ebb 
internationally in the 50s after Suez, in the 1970s when Britain was regarded as the sick man of Europe, respect for her never wavered. She burnished the reputation of Britain on the international stage. She encouraged political stability. She's been described as a kind of hidden backstop in the Constitution, a force field around which uh, 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 good behaviour within the political establishment was encouraged. And these things, you know, should not be underestimated. And finally, she kept the monarchy strong and respected, reigning very much in the style of her beloved father, George VI. And she kept it strong, really, by above all, by setting a personal example. And one might imagine that her greatest hope now will be that the strength of the monarchy will continue under King Charles and then under William.